A very good morning to all the participants present today in the fourth technical session of the three day international webinar on Neither East nor West Vistas of Postcolonial Discourses, being organized by Department of English, Women's College, Agatala, Tripura, India. Today is the third as well as the last day of the webinar. In this technical session, we have with us Dr. Pallavi Gupta, lecturer in English, University of Illinois, USA, Dr. Sujata Menon, language teacher and trainer from Zazan University, Saudi Arabia, and Dr. Devjani Shengupto, associate professor in English from Indraprastha College for Women, University of Delhi. Uh, so on behalf of the organizing committee and on my own behalf, I warmly welcome you all in this webinar. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Pallavi Gupta, who is a lecturer in English from University of Illinois, USA. Uh, so I am introducing Dr. Gupta to the audience. Pallavi Gupta is a very young and energetic lecturer in English at University of Illinois, USA. She was born and brought up in Nepal and pursued her undergraduate studies in Jadupur University, Kolkata. She received her MA in English from Kansas State University and PhD in English Literature from Georgia State University, USA. Her research focuses on the novels of Charlotte Bronte and Jane Austen, modern British literature and South Asian studies. She has published extensively in the field of children's literature. Today, she will give her talk on Frances Horson Burnett and the Colonial Orphan. Dr. Gupta, the platform is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for having me here today uh, to speak about some of my thoughts on uh, reading Frances Hodgson Burnett's novel in a new, a new kind of analysis for me. So I appreciate your presence, your interest in hearing me a lot. And now I shall begin. So today I'm going to share with you some ways of performing post-colonial readings using the economic concept of opportunity cost. I will be focusing on two major works produced during what is considered the golden age of children's literature in the West, A Little Princess that was published in 1905 and The Secret Garden that was published in 1911. Both these novels are by the British American author Frances Hodgson Burnett. I will also talk briefly about Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre that was published in 1847. And I will discuss uh, Professor Guy Three Spivak's 1985 article titled Three Women's Texts and a Critique of Imperialism. As you can infer, I will be addressing three novels written at three different time periods, a critical piece written almost 100 years after that, and an economic concept. So I assure you that I will connect all three of these uh, things coherently so you can take away at least some new ideas on dealing with texts from post-colonial point of view. First, let me refresh your memories about A Little Princess and The Secret Garden. For those of you who have, have not read these novels, I hope I will be able to address them in such a manner that you don't feel left out from our conversation today for not knowing the stories. Um, a Little Princess presents the story of a small girl named Sarah Crew, and she is seven years old. Her father is a captain in the British Army posted in India, and we learn that her mother passed away when she was a baby. Sarah is born and brought up in India by her father, and she is looked after by her ayah. She is a happy child, but not healthy. When she turns seven, her father thinks it will be good for her health-wise and educationally, it will be good for her to study in England instead of staying in India with him. And therefore, the story begins as she joins a boarding school in London and her father returns to India without her. And this is where A Little Princess begins. 
The Secret Garden, on the other hand, written by the same author, um, is a story of another little girl named Mary Lennox. Mary is nine years old when the story begins. Her father, too, is a captain in the British Army who lives in India. She, too, is born and brought up in India, mostly under her eyes' care. While Mary's mother lives, the mother abandons Mary from birth because she never wanted a child. They live in the same house, but Mary's mother seldom visits her. So Mary, like Sarah, is motherless. Soon, due to a cholera outbreak, both Mary's parents pass away, and she's taken to England to live with her distantly related uncle in an English manner. And this is where Mary's story begins in The Secret Garden. Now, the reason I'm interested in these two novels when it comes to post-colonial understanding is because India is depicted and used in a very interesting way by the author. Both novels perceive the heroine's living situation in one of two possibilities, in India or in England. In each case, the heroine is brought to England on the pretext of good health and a nationalistic obligation, so to say, a sense that they are English by race and culture and therefore must be raised and educated in England. When in England, both Sarah and Mary face challenges in their own living situations. Sarah lives in a boarding school where the person in authority dislikes her. Mary lives in an old English manor with an absent uncle, and she is, for the first time in her life, on her own. So without the constant support of any caretakers, which she has been used to in India. Furthermore, Mary is very ill-natured, very ill-behaved, and that's why she's a very unlikable girl for the rest of the characters around her at first. Eventually, after coming to England, both the girls' health improves, and additionally, they find their purpose as well. That is, both take upon the informal task of taking care of one other orphan in their new homes. They become motherly in a way. Sarah uses imagination and storytelling to soothe Lottie, a four-year-old motherless girl, and Mary uses gardening and other perambulations in nature to heal her cousin Colin from his sicknesses. In all this, we are frequently reminded that these girls are able to perform these tasks because they are in England and not in India. Even though the novels are primarily set in England and India only appears in the beginning of the novels, India is ever present in the narrative because everything that happens in England for these girls depends on comparisons drawn either by the narrator or by the girls themselves between India, India and England. So before I engage with these novels critically, let me tell you a little bit about how India is depicted in these novels that were published in 1905 and 1911, just to give you a sense of the time. When the narrator introduces Mary in The Secret Garden, we learn, and I'm quoting, her hair was yellow, her face was yellow because she had been born in India and had always been ill in one way or another. Her father had held a position under the English government and had always been busy and ill himself, end quote. Such description suggests that illness and India go hand in hand for some reason. When Mary speaks to the maid Martha when she's in England, the narrator tells us that she spoke, and I quote, the Indian way, which is speaking in a domineering manner because she is used to dominate, uh, being a dominating figure when she was in India. So her Indian voice is the imperious voice, says the narrator. All the other characters in the novel point out to Mary that she has been frail and weak because she wasn't brought up in the moors of England. The narrator says, and I quote, in India, she always felt hot and too languid to care much about anything. The fact that the fresh wind from the moor had begun to blow the cobwebs of her young brain and to waken up a little, end quote. 
The suggestion is that in India, Mary's mind as well as her body was too lethargic, too languid, um, so much that there were cobwebs in her brain because of underuse of brain and under underperformance of any action. So later on, the narrator says that, and I quote, in India, she had always been too hot and languid and weak to care much about anything. But in this place, meaning England, she was beginning to care and to want to do new things. If we look at a little princess, Sarah's situation is very similar. She is very weak because she is born and raised in India, the narrator tells us. And the narrator also explains, and I quote, the climate of India was very bad for children. As soon as possible, they were sent away from it, generally to England and to school. She had seen other children, see she being Sarah, she had seen other children go away and had heard their fathers and mothers talk about the letters they received from them. Sarah had known that she would be obliged to go also and though sometimes her father's stories of the voyage and the new country had attracted her, new country being England for her, uh, though sometimes the stories of the voyage of the new country attracted her, she had been troubled by the thought that he could not stay with her. We see that India is depicted very generally in these novels. Everyone in India is associated with their roles rather than for who they are as individuals. We are told of the ayahs, but not once do we hear even a single name of an ayah. Even their professions are generally generalized as these girls, especially Mary, believe that Indians have only been servants. It makes sense from her point of view. She's only nine years old and she has maybe only seen them as servants, but this is what the novel is telling us as well. The narrator thinks of India, what I would say Hollywood thinks of Mexico from a very yellow camera lens, as if the sun is always shining and it is always hot and the world is always yellow wherever you look. The atmosphere is always too hot there and the narrator allows no diversity in climactic conditions at all. Everything about the place for that reason is not specific in that description. It is clear from this generalization that the author has not been in India, the place she writes about so confidently. However, she does feel confident enough to include India or use the country as a major backdrop for not one but two of her novels. Now you and I will agree that if we have never been to say France, then perhaps we will not write our novel stating that our protagonists were born and brought up in France and they come to live in India because France didn't suit them. Even if we do, we won't constantly compare France and India when we haven't been there or known its language or its people. So it is interesting how the author of The Secret Garden and A Little Princess sees this entire country. She sees it only as a colony that can be used to make the beginning of her novel interesting, to make the outset of her novel unique. So this is a way imperialism is practiced by members of the literary sphere as well if we pay some close attention to how space is used in some of the novels. So from what we know, not only does India serve as a backdrop, but also as a place that is there only to serve as a contrast to the heroine's experience in England with. The author comes to the point of almost misusing India to build her plot. And this brings me to Gayatri Spivak's 1985 article that was published in the journal Critical Inquiry. The article is titled Three Women's Texts and a Critique of Imperialism. I come to this article because Spivak's understanding of the character Bertha Mason in Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre is what motivates my reading of India in Frances Hodgson Burnett's novels. Spivak begins her article saying, and I quote, it should not be possible to read 19th century British literature without remembering that imperialism, understood as England's social mission, was a crucial part of the cultural representation of England to the English. 
the role of literature in the production of cultural representation should not be ignored. And this is a very important point, so I will repeat this. Spivak says, it should not be possible to read 19th century British literature without remembering that imperialism, which is England's social mission, was a crucial part of the cultural representation of England to the English. This, I believe, is crucial when it comes to reading British literature written during colonial times. Soon after, Spivak says, it seems particularly unfortunate when the emergent perspective of feminist criticism reproduces the axioms of imperialism. Here, Spivak talks about how her critique of Jane Eyre's subjectivity has saddened some of her fellow feminists of her time. She believes that to applaud texts like Jane Eyre as feminist texts and not read the colonial denotations and connotations it carries is to do criticism a disservice because it is texts like Jane Eyre that reproduce the axioms or the principles of imperialism, according to Spivak. Everybody here surely knows the plot of Jane Eyre, so I won't waste your time summarizing it on its entirety. I will, however, briefly remind you what happens when Jane lives in Thornfield Hall in Charlotte Bonte's Jane Eyre as a governess, so that we all are on the same page when it comes to discussions that moves around the character of Bertha Mason. So when Jane Eyre is 18 years old, she joins the staff of a very prestigious manor in the town of Milcott. And she joins that manor as a governess, and the manor is called Thornfield Hall. And its owner, Jane's employer, is Mr. Edward Rochester. Now, Mr. Rochester has a young French girl who he has taken as his ward, and he's taking care of her. And this a little young girl is for whom Jane is hired as a governess for. Now, as Jane spends her time in Thornfield Hall, she grows very fond of Mr. Rochester and he grows fond of her. Uh, love blossoms. Jane enjoys her stay in the manor thoroughly, except for those times, especially at nights when she hears a very loud sound. Sometimes it is a hysterical laughter and sometimes it's a mysterious cry. Now, the housekeeper um, has Jane believe that it is one of the house staff who makes those noises. But after some time, um, after some time, Rochester confesses his love for Jane, and Jane confesses her love for Rochester, and they decide to marry. On the day of marriage, it is revealed to Jane by a man that Mr. Rochester is already married. And he gives his wife, hidden in the third story of the same house, she has been living all this time. Mr. Rochester admits that he does have a living wife in the same house, but says, defends himself, saying that she's completely insane. The, the wife is completely um, insane. He says that she comes from a very mad family and she has inherited that madness and he had no choice than to hide his mad wife from the world. He says that he's in a way protecting her. When Rochester takes Jane to see this mad wife, Jane later learns her name is Bertha Mason. So she tells her readers, as Jane is also the narrator of the story, she tells her readers that Bertha Mason is a very tall, large, bestial woman who even tries to attack Jane at one point. So the narrator states that Bertha is a Creole woman um, coming from Jamaica, and Rochester tells Jane that she is from the Caribbean. Rochester apologizes to Jane so much and explains that his situation, his problems, but disappointed with him, Jane leaves him. She changes her name. She seeks employment elsewhere so that Rochester cannot find her. And in that process, Jane finds her living cousins and also learns that she has inherited a lot of money as well. All this while, she holds love for Mr. Rochester. One night, she she sleeps and she hears him cry her name in her sleep and decides to go see him. Now, here comes an important twist. 
She walks to Thornfield Hall only to find that the manor is now in ruins. A local person tells her that Rochester's mad wife, Bertha Mason, set the manor in fire one day a year ago. And during that fire, in an attempt to save that wife from falling, Rochester loses his eye. Unfortunately, Bertha dies. Jane goes where Rochester is currently living and they reunite. At the end of the novel, Jane and Rochester finally marry and they even have a son together. And the novel ends with the hint that Rochester is regaining his eyesight. So it's a very happy ending. Now, critics of Jane Eyre say that Jane Eyre is a very feminist text. And they should say that because it is feminist for it for the time it was published in. Jane is a very strong heroine. And if there is one thing we take away from her personality, it is her eagerness to the point of restlessness to become an independent woman. Jane Eyre consists of famous quotations like, I am no bird and no cage can ensnare me, or women feel just equally as men feel. However, Spivak says that one should pause and examine what Jane Eyre's feminism really stands on. According to Spivak, Jane is able to achieve her feminist status, her independence, her individuality by sacrificing the dependence, the individuality, the status of Bertha Mason. In Spivak's words, and I quote, in this fictive England, Bertha must play out her role act out the transformation of herself into that fictive other. Bertha must set fire to the house and kill herself so that Jane Eyre can become the feminist individualist heroine of British fiction. I must read this as an allegory of the general epistemic violence of imperialism, says Vivak. The construction of a self-immolating colonial subject for the glorification of the social mission of the colonizer. This part is worth repeating, so if I may. The construction of a self-immolating colonial subject like Bertha for the glorification of the social mission of the colonizer. So according to Spivak, Bertha is in a way sacrificed by the author, by the narrative, she is sacrificed to have Jane stand out as a feminist heroine of her times. In my reading of the depiction of India in Frances Hodgson Burnett's novels, a very similar sacrifice happens. This time, the compromised or the sacrificed is not the person, but the country, I think. India is used only to have England stand out. India is immolated for the glorification of England. India's hot climate is discussed only to compare it with the cool weather of Yorkshire moors that energizes Mary. Or India's languid atmosphere is mentioned only to compare it with that of London, where Sarah becomes held day by day. The ayahs of India are mentioned only to grant a solid introduction to the working class caretakers in the English manners, English houses. Now let's remove India from these stories. Let's remove India from A Little Princess and um, The Secret Garden. Suppose Sarah is coming for, to London from a distant town north of the country, or suppose Mary comes to her uncle's manor from another village situated far from theirs. There is no India in the picture. In that case, the novels are less exciting to readers. They are less engaging even. If India is removed from the secret garden, then many of Mary's personal traits are removed too. That is, we are told that Mary is ill-tempered because she has always gotten what she wanted through her ayahs. Mary cannot dress herself because her ayah has always helped her dress her. Mary is rude in England because no one really cares deeply and genuinely for her in India. Because of this, the growth of her temperament in England, the emergence of her positive nature makes the reader feel as though they have journeyed with her toward her individuation. When characters start caring for Mary in England, the readers participate in her happiness because they know that even her parents didn't care for her back in India. 
When Mary eats bread and butter and gains weight, the readers celebrate her good health. When Mary compares Martha, uh, one of the subordinate, one of the uh, maids in her uncle's manor, when she compares Martha to her servants in India and mistakes Martha's role in the English manor, the readers get a comic moment in the novel. Mary and her cousin bond in a very family way when Mary does when Mary does to call in what her ayah is to do to her. She caresses him to self singing a quote unquote Hindustani song. So there are many small and big moments in the secret garden whose intensity is characterized by their contrast with what used to happen in India. And in fact, the central action of the secret garden is Mary's search for a garden. And look at this from an imperialist point of view. The central action of secret garden is Mary's search for a garden that has been hidden, her discovery of that space, her interest in its condition and its location, her wonder, her curiosity about its inhabit inhabitant, which happens to be a red-breasted robin, her participation in gardening while inside it, her ability to change how this space looks, her belief that she owns the garden because she happened upon it, and her use of the garden to heal her cousin, who everyone thinks is dying. She's using the garden over and over again. So Mary in this novel is an imperialist herself. And much like her English representatives in India and other colonized countries, Mary herself is a colonizer as she colonizes the garden. And this brings me back to Spivak's words. Now, I argue that India is for a little princess and the secret garden what Bertha Mason is for Jane Eyre. And now, let me begin talking about an economic concept to make our talk a little interdisciplinary as well. Let me talk about an economic concept that I think can be used as a method to interrogate the compromises and the nature of such compromises in children's literature or other literature as well when we are doing a post-colonial reading of them. Uh, before I do so, however, I must explain what I mean by compromises in children's literature. Now, texts that come across in children's literature usually have a set framework. It is, in one way or the other, an orphan protagonist's journey to a world different than what they have been accustomed to. Now, if you think about any children's literature or any children's movie or any children's story, the protagonist is without their parents. They, are, they either have died or they are absent from that zone for the time being. And the protagonist is usually moving from one world to the other. So most of the time, he or she is an orphan. But even if she has, he or she has living parents, their parents seldom accompany them in their journeys. Now, speaking of a different world, uh, for example, Alice enters Wonderland in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Wendy goes to Neverland in Peter Pan. Uh, Nycteris and Photogen go beyond the captivity of their tower in The Day Boy and the Night Girl. Think of stories like The Little Red Riding Hood, where she's going from one place to the other without her parents. Jack and the Beanstalk, Hansel and Gretel, I think about novel series like Anne of Green Gables or The Wizard of Oz, uh, Pollyanna, James and the Giant Peach, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Matilda, The Fellowship of the Ring, Narnia, even the Harry Potter series, you name it. This framework usually falls into place. And I didn't even enter the young adult uh, literature genre. So you can think of numerous examples of fantasy stories and novels, uh, even on TV, on screen, where an orphan child is up against adventures that typically take place in a world away from their usual world. Now, when it concerns children's literature, children are not only focused as an audience, but also as a perspective in these novels. The world is seen through their eyes and through their adventures and not an adult perspective or not their parents' or guardians' perspectives. Now, in that regard, like Sarah or Mary from Burnett's novels, these children are their own caretakers. 
they take decisions whether to follow the rabbit inside the hole or not, or whether to believe in Hagrid and go to Diagon Alley with him or not. They may be under someone's care and shelter, but when this new world comes along to the protagonists, they are on their own mostly. Now, every time this happens in children's literature, the world becomes divided into two possibilities, one that they are living in and one that they are going toward, one that they have been accustomed to and one that requires some level of acclimatization on their part. So when anything comes along with two possibilities like this or two choices, there is an economic concept that helps us think about where we situate our choices and preferences and what we give value to. And the concept is called opportunity cost. I believe many of you are familiar with the concept, but for those that are not, let me explain what opportunity cost is. Now, the dictionary definition says, the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. Suppose there are two alternatives for anything and you choose one. You would have potentially gained something from choosing the other two, right? But you didn't choose that, you chose another one. So the loss of potential gain from the other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. In other words, let me explain this a little bit more. If you are doing something, then what are you letting go to do that thing? Say you usually wake up at 7 a.m., but tomorrow you have an exam, so you wake up at 5 a.m. to study. What did you gain by waking up at 5? You gained two hours of study time. What did you lose? You lost the potential gain you would have achieved through two hours of sleep. Say you decided not to study, but to sleep instead. What did you gain? You gained sleep. What gain did you sacrifice to gain sleep? Studying. So when you chose an option between the two, there is always something you give up to do the other thing. And what you give up is the opportunity cost of what you do. And this concept can be applied to anything, really. It can be applied to the action such as sleeping or studying. It can be applied to choosing between a mango and a watermelon when you have space in your stomach just for one. It can be applied to shopping when you're choosing between two items of clothing and so on and so forth. I think bringing this concept of opportunity cost to children's literature has its benefits. And it is effective, and we can also perform post-colonial analysis by using this concept. So here is how. As I said earlier, the children's literature in these literatures um, are always giving up being, uh, sorry, the children in these literatures are always giving up being in one space to participate in other space. So being in one space has an opportunity cost. When I say I use this as a method, I think of what is compromised in these novels. In case of A Little Princess and The Secret Garden, India is a place that they give up to be in England. However, giving up India isn't a sacrifice for them because the narrator clearly demonstrates that the heroine would not have achieved anything had they been in India, but they achieve a lot because they are in England. So India isn't given up by these heroines. There is no regret in giving it up for a better choice. It's not that they would have benefited staying in India as well as England, but they chose England. So the opportunity cost of choosing England is India. No, India is given up happily. There is no opportunity cost of living in England. And this shows the poor treatment of India in this post-colonial reading. Now let's look at Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book, for instance, and from this lens. Mowgli enters the world inside the jungle from the world of humans when he's a baby. So one cannot say that to enter the jungle was his choice. But at the end of the novel, he leaves the jungle to enter the human world, which is his choice. He chooses between his life inside the jungle and his life outside. So the opportunity cost of living with humans for him is living with his friends and family in the animal world. Mm -hmm. 
Similarly, at the end of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Alice wakes up from her sleep, from her wonderland, and rejoins her family with her sister. The opportunity cost of living with her family is the wonderland. Similarly, in Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are, there is a little boy named Max who, um, who, who does not behave appropriately. So his mother says, dinner is canceled, go to your room. He goes to his room and then he starts imagining worlds and he goes to a world where the wild things are. So at the end, he again returns to the world where his parents live. So Max's opportunity cost of returning to his parents is being king of the wild things. And in this way, we can read many children's stories to see what are they giving up to achieve their first priorities. What kind of spaces are being given up? What are kind of spaces are being sacrificed? However, this concept is inapplicable to A Little Princess and the Secret Garden where there are clearly two different worlds as the heroine negotiates them, but there is an eraser happening, such eraser of the opportunity cost is happening. And this is indicative of how the value of India is erased even by the author. Now, just like the value of the non-magic world or the muggle world in Harry Potter is diminished, we can compare this actually. Harry enters the world of witchcraft and wizardry in the Harry Potter books and is happy to enter it. He does not miss his muggle life. He does not think he regrets giving up anything to be in that world. However, both the worlds, the muggle world and the witchcraft world are situated in the same country, in the same culture. The people are similar, the languages are similar, the customs and everything, festivities are similar. So that way, the eraser of the opportunity cost is happening in Harry Potter too, but it does not indicate that the removal of an entire region is happening or the remover or the erasing of an entire culture is happening. But in Burnett's novels, it is happening. India is being erased and the value of being there is nothing at all. So it doesn't even appear as a cost. It has no value. And this, I believe, is what Spivak means when she says that imperialism was a crucial part of cultural representation of England and the role of literature in this production of cultural representation should not be ignored when you are doing a post-colonial reading. When you are doing, Spivak in fact says it should not be ignored when you're doing any kind of reading. So all this brings me to consider the notion of cultural hegemony even. And Marxist understanding of the term cultural hegemony happens when one class in, within a society dominates numerous others in order to impose their culture, their language, their customs, and other such aspects as the representative aspect of the entire society or the goal of the entire society. In literature such as Burnett's, even though there is not a direct domination of one part of society by the other is happening, even if it is just alluded to, it is important to notice what is put forward in the notion that England is the bar by which all other atmospheres and cultures should be measured. Now, as I near the end of my talk, I would encourage you to approach post-colonial thinking as a way of how the colonies have been treated in classic works, works of literature. And this approach isn't new, of course, I'm not saying anything new today, but when we think of treatment, we don't necessarily have to look for those instances where the treatment is direct or it's violent or it's outright or having immediate results. The treatment can be subtle and manipulative as well. For instance, in A Little Princess and the Secret Garden, India is barely shown, but it is mentioned all throughout the novel. It looms in the background, but then again, it is erased. So there is also a double bind happening. Now, even though at the end of the lecture, I would like to say that even though I am an admirer of and a follower of post-colonial studies and scholars, from what I have written and read so far, I cannot call myself a post-colonial scholar. Uh, my primary research interest lies in the Victorian literature field. So for this reason, I may not have brought to you 
all the ways in which we could perceive the representation of India in Burnett's novels. Uh, maybe you are thinking of so many other terms you are familiar with uh, as post-colonial scholars and readers with uh, when it comes to post-colonial reading of literature that I perhaps did not mention. Uh, I would love to hear from you and learn from you. So during the question answer sessions, uh, please don't limit me from the opportunity to learn from you as well. So please don't think you only need to ask me a question. You can also put forward some observations as well and mentions what I haven't been able to mention so that we all can benefit. And with this note, I'd like to thank you for inviting me once again. Thank you for your time, for your attention. You have an opportunity cost of listening to me today. So thank you for giving that up. I appreciate your presence a lot. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gupta. It was a valuable and a very crystal clear presentation. And actually, uh, we can see the comments also. And there are some questions for you. Uh, the questions will be displayed on the screen. Uh, you can uh, okay. see the question on the screen. So let me do it. Uh, should I read the questions myself? I see one from Lakshmi Priyadarshini. Uh, yeah. uh, can you see the particular oh, question? Yes, what yes, is yes, on yes, your screen? I am on the right side of my screen. OK. Uh, so the question, uh, Rakshanda Naim, and um, I will be addressing you by your name because I don't know our ages. So I hope you won't mind if I'm addressing someone older than me by first name. Uh, in David Copperfield, says Rakshanda, the text starts with I am born. Who is that I in the novel? The novelist, Charles Dickens. The protagonist in the novel or the reader who reads and emerges as a person. Yeah, I can't understand. Sorry, is that something to me? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. you continue. So, continue, not to, to you. Right. Uh, oh, no, that's I right. forgot to uh, unmute. So, again, I'm sorry, I didn't maybe read it clearly. So, Rakshanda says In David Copperfield, the text starts with I am born. Who is that I in the novel? Uh, the novelist, Charles Dickens. Uh, the protagonist in the novel or the reader who reads and emerges as a person. Um, it can be anything. And these questions are fantastic to start research projects on. Uh, you have to challenge your thinking. You have to challenge who the conventional I would be. Um, the very conventional answer to this is because it's a first person narrator, uh, what narratology tells us is that we must never confuse the author with the narrator. Even if when we know that um, it is a first person narrator, we should never say that Dickens uh, says this. We should always say the narrator says this because Dickens is writing a novel, even if the perspective is from a first person narration, we cannot confuse the two identities. That's what narratology tells us. Uh, however, uh, considering that um, David Copperfield is autobiographical in many ways, if you ever have to claim that it is Charles Dickens who is saying, I am born, then you will have to establish the similarities first, and then you will be able to claim that it might be Charles Dickens. Um, if you are saying it is the reader, which is I am born, it is a very intelligent analysis, but I'm afraid none of these are facts. Uh, everything is an interpretation. And if you would ask me, I would go with the most conventional one, that once you enter the space of the novel, let us not think that the author is the character or the narrator. Otherwise, it would not be fiction. It would be nonfiction. So that is my answer. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, here is another one. OK, Lakshmi Priyadarshini uh, is asking, is Jane Eyre a likable protagonist? Why or why not? Can we say we have some Gothic elements in Jane Eyre too? Is White Sargasso C an anti-colonial text? Uh, very good uh, questions, Lakshmi, Lakshmi. And if possible, Dr. Saha, would you let the question be in the screen? So because it has multiple parts, I don't want to forget any part. OK, thank you. Uh, 
Yeah. Thank you. Oh, so why not? Why again, not? Engineer, likable or not, it's a subjective point of view. My PhD dissertation was on Charlotte Bronte's novels. I like Jane Eyre a lot. Um, we must understand that if we criticize a character, does not mean that we have to dislike the character. And also, um, the birth of the modern hero or the heroine is that he or she is a flawed character in many times. So modern interpretation of protagonists really accepts the fact that anyone can be flawed. There, there can be a character arc that's going upward or downward. So it is no longer the case in criticism and reading of fiction that a character for a character to be likable, he or she only has to be morally very good, right? You may like a villain too. You may love Macbeth, uh, but Macbeth is a flawed character, right? So is Jane Eyre a likable protagonist? Personally, yes, because she has done a lot for her times as a protagonist as well. Uh, when the novel Jane Eyre was published in 1847, there was no custom of writing autobiographies of common day people, let alone women. And uh, only famous people used to write autobiographies, but in Jane Eyre, the Jane Eyre's subtitle says, Jane Eyre and autobiography. Now let's not confuse this with Charlotte Bronte's autobiography, of course. Charlotte Bronte is presenting her fictional character, Jane Eyre, as an author, and she's the one writing an autobiography. So someone who dared to do that as a woman in that time, where even the writer was writing under pseudonym, it's, it's, a very, it's a very feminist text in many ways. Um, her second question is, can we have some Gothic elements in Jane Eyre too? Yes, lots of articles are written about the Gothic uh, elements in Jane Eyre. And it is one of the most um, discussed topics as well, uh, how Jane Eyre is part of that uh, Gothic movement in literature. So yes, we can, of course. And the third question is, it, is White Sargasso Sea an anti-colonial text? White Sargasso Sea was written by John, John Rees um, in the 1980s, I'm thinking, or was it the 60s? Um, it was written at least like 100 years after Jane Eyre was. Uh, I would not term it, uh, it's, I think to call it a colonial or anti-colonial is to say that uh, Reese was writing from one perspective, but what Reese was doing, uh, writing that text, is saying that you cannot erase colonial subjects like this. Look what happens when we erase the English woman in this novel. So White Sargas, you see, for those of us who don't know, is a novel that is written in response to Jane Eyre uh, almost 100 years later. And the main perspective of that novel is Bertha Mason. She is the first person narrator, not Jane Eyre. And Jane Eyre appears in the novel not even as a fully formed character. She's just one little character, like Bertha is a little character in Jane Eyre. So what happens is that Rees is saying, by writing a novel from Bertha's perspective, saying that you have to look at the colonial subject as a subject. Don't just look at the colonial subject as an object. So she's making a claim. And uh, around that time, there was also a movement. You, I'm sure all of you know the empire writes back. So I think, although it's not empire writing back, um, Reese was also an English author, but then it is contributing to that movement, that sentiment. So her, 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 her idea, it's, she, she does talk about colonialism because that's how the character of Rochester meets Bertha, meets Antoinette in uh, White Sargasso Sea, but I cannot really say it's anti-colonial or colonial, you know? And I'm sure the sentiment is anti-colonial though. Sorry, that was long answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 it happens. Uh... Here is another one. 
Okay, Atri Majumdar is asking, has the feminist movement aligned itself with concomitant social justice movements? Has it incorporated the discourse against systemic racism? Um, has the locus of critique shifted from literary texts? Uh, I have a feeling Atri Majumdar is asking this about our contemporary times. And Dr. Saha, I would ask you to keep this question here as well. Um, so contemporary times, um, there is, um, I would hate to I would hate to make a mistake here. So it's either Homi Bhabha, I think it's Homi Bhabha, um, who talks about post-representationality. Or it might be Radha Krishnan too. I would hate to make this a uh, uh, mistake. But there is um there is a concept is in postcolonial theory, and as I told you again, I am very new to postcolonial studies, so so I may make mistakes here. But there is a concept that says um, an idea should have post representational ability, which means that feminism uh, should not be only limited to feminism. Feminism should can should have the ability to transform, to transcend to other to other issues, to other isms. Uh, feminism should be having the ability to go to ecologies and have ecofeminism, you know. So an idea should have the post-representational quality mm. to it. Yes, Dr. Sam? Yeah, my, you, you continue. Uh, by oh, fault, okay. it happened. Oh, OK, <laughs> sorry. I'm just uh, drawing you out so many times. Uh, so has so the question is, has the feminist movement aligned itself with concomitant social um, justice movements? I think it has. I think it has. There are, I'm living in USA right now. Um, there are, um, I, I hear about Nepal and India all the time and South Asia in general. So I don't have one example coming to my mind right now, but I think it has. And this is the post-representationality I was talking about. Has it incorporated the discourse against systemic racism? Yes, of course, actually. Uh, last semester, my my student who is doing her undergrad wrote a paper on the injustices of the black woman in hospitals because some of the drugs that are tested, and this has been happening for so many years and it still happens now, some of the drugs that are tested to experiment or some kinds of pregnancies are treated differently just as an experiment because they belong to a minority race in some people. So a black woman's pregnancy experience or delivery experience might be different than a white woman's pregnancy or delivery experience. So yes, the topic of feminism does transfer to uh, systemic racism as well. I hope I kind of answered you or Atri Majumdar. Yes. And I am moving to the next one. Oh, so, yeah, sorry, I was looking at the comments here. Uh, so, Sudipta Chatterjee asked, why do post colonialists, especially post colonial feminists like Gayatri Spivak, adore uh, this loopy? Arsonist. Uh, what is loopy arson? Dr. Saha, do you have any? Uh, sorry, I don't have any idea about that one. Oh, hold on. I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't want to ignore a question because of my lacking. So, uh, yeah, of course. I don't know setting. Oh, okay. So I, I just Googled arson is the criminal act of deliberately setting fire to property. Okay. Could you show me the question again, Dr. Saha? Yeah, uh, the previous one. Yeah, Gayatri Spivak and arsonist one. Okay, let's see. Why do post-colonialists, especially post-colonial feminists like Gayatri Spivak, adore this? Oh, now I, I, I see the question. And this is a very important question. I'm so glad I stuck with it and then looked at the um, meaning. So by loopy arsonist, you mean a mad woman who sets fire to the house. Um, Sudipta Chatterjee, it is high time, 
high time that we don't look at madness as a crime, that we try to understand madness or any, any mental health related matter as a part of someone that needs care, attention, medication even. And what they are doing is not out of spite, not out of rationale. They are doing something that's not in control within themselves. And Gayatri Spivak is not promoting a um, mad person setting fire in the house. She's not saying that. Postcolonialists are not saying that. And this is very important. I'm so glad you brought this up. Postcolonial thinkers are saying that the mad woman who sets fire to the house happens to be a Creole woman. She just happens to be someone from uh, the col colony. It could not be another English white woman, you know. So if someone is mad, then why is that madness being represented by the other? If someone is doing a crime, even though it's, uh, it's because of her madness or not, why is the crime happening from there? And then we never even hear Bertha speak a single word. So we don't know if she's the one who set fire to the house. We do not hear her voice. She's the subaltern here. We do not know what happens. So sometimes what texts do are they leave the unexplainable, the mistake, even the cri criminal parts to some people who don't have voice to some people who are not represented. So what Gayatri Spivak and post-colonialists are saying is that why is the mad woman who sets fire to the house a woman from the colony? You know, that's the question. It's not like supporting mad woman who uh, sets fire to the house. So that's an important point. And uh, the other thing is that, um, I think I made my point. I think, yeah, that's my answer. So I think you have misread Spivak and post-colonialists. This character is very interesting. Oh, yeah. And the other point was like in many movies, in many uh, Hollywood movies, let's say, they say that the Black, in any horror movie, if there is a group of friends, then the Black person dies first. Why? So it's not asking this question isn't being supportive or insupportive of the black race. It is asking, why is the compromised the person of color? Why is the heroine the person, the white person, you know? Yeah. Uh, should I go for the last one? Uh, yeah, of course. So Bidipta is asking, can we say that David Copperfield is a colonial dissemination of self? In that time, Dickens was more interested to establish himself from a global perspective than his national uh, identity. Hold on. Um, what year was what year was David Copperfield in? Uh, because my answer would depend on that. Was it 62 or what is it? Serialized in 1814. Okay, so 40s, 50s. Can we say that David Copperfield is colonial dissemination of the self? Um, I am so far, I haven't visited David Copperfield for 12 years. So I am forgetting the uh, details of the novel. Um, I am actually, I don't remember the details of the novel to answer you, but you know what, Bidipta, the way you are asking it, I feel, I sense so much of confidence in your question that I have a feeling you are inclining toward yes. And if you are confused, this will make an excellent, a very intelligent paper topic. So you must do more research on that. I am very much at fault here. I do not remember David Copperfield clearly, so I should not confuse my memory of Dickens and answer your question haphazardly, so I'm sorry. But please pursue this. It's a very good question, and you seem to be showing quite some confidence on the question. OK, fine, Dr. Gupta. That was a very good interaction. And uh, of course, the brilliant presentation 
it was a great experience to get you amongst us and it is uh, the late night no and oh, at your late it. night you are uh, just devoting your precious time with us while your baby is sleeping and that and uh, we are extremely grateful to you for okay. your mess mesmerizing presentation uh, and uh, we hope that in your near future you will just um, uh, enjoy a glorifying career thank you so much and i'd love to visit you again talk with you again and thank you so much for your participation and as i told you i know it's sunday and then you are you know you would have been busy in other things i really appreciate your presence as well all of you and i'm yeah. seeing so many comments thank you so much i really appreciate that thank you thank you dr dr gupta we'll meet you soon uh, and i invite you to come to india and of course, of course. Uh, in our college yeah of course i'd love to i'd love to and i'd send the invitation to you as well illinois is a very good place and you will always have a home here yeah of course dr gupta thank you so much All good right. night bye uh, dr menon uh, Namaskar and uh, a very welcome to you, Dr. Sujata Menon, uh, in on our virtual platform. Plus, uh, Madam, I request you to unmute yourself, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're perfectly audible, ma'am. Uh, so, very good morning to you, ma'am. Uh, it is already afternoon, <laughs> 12 noon is now the time. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> The you, four hours behind us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Behind uh, Indian time. Yes, 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 yes. The, that is good morning to you because our uh, speakers are from various parts of the world. And I bid good night to the previous speaker. And now I am bidding good morning to you. So that is the obviously the advantage of the technology so that uh, we can just uh, meet together from various parts of the world and uh, of course ma'am i heartily welcome you uh, in our webinar and uh, i request uh, our hod madam uh, mrs sherbari nath to introduce you to the landed audience good morning madam okay i'm just going to introduce to the audience dr sujata menon dr sujata menon is a language teacher and a trainer at zazan university saudi arabia she has been teaching for 24 years at the tertiary level. She has many publications in her, to her credit and has conducted more than 45 workshops, webinars, and training programs. She is a storyteller and is deeply interested in oral storytelling, myth, and mythopoeia, technology enhanced language learning, and material design. She has also expertise in Literary, she is also an expertise in literary studies, literary criticism, critical theory, gender studies, narratology, and feminism. She won the Excellence Award for publication in Zazan University in 2019. Above all, she is a diehard and passionate te teacher. Today, Madam will give a talk on Woman as Subaltern, a peek into the mythopoeic narrative. Welcome, Madam. A very good morning, and the platform is all yours. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Namaskar. Uh, let me just share my screen. PPT, come here. Are you able to see the PPT? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Is the first is the picture of the flower and the title visible? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's uh, clear. Okay. So, Namaskar to everyone present here. Yeah. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, everyone who has made it possible to attend the webinar, who has taken time off on a Sunday. To sit before your mobiles or before your laptops and to listen to me. And pronouns to all the resource persons who have made this webinar so enriching. So, as you see, my topic is on women as subaltern. And my focus will be on the mythopoic narrative, the narrative which indulges in myth making. So, let me start off with a very popular 
shloka about the qualities of a woman. Karyeshu dasi, karaneshu mantri, gojeshu mata, shayaneshu ramba, rupeshu lakshmi, shameshu dhatri, shat dharma yukta, kula dharma patni, karyeshu dasi. She who works for you like a maid, karaneshu mantri. She who counsels you like a minister, but uh, that is a big question mark. Bhojeshu Mata, she who feeds you like a mother. Shaineshu Ramba, she who satisfies you like a courtesan in bed. Rupeshu Lakshmi, she who is as beautiful as the goddess Lakshmi. Shameshu Datri, she who is as patient as the earth. Shat Dharma Yukta, she who is endowed with these six virtues, not qualities, virtues, Dharma Yukta. Kula Dharma Patni, only she who is endowed with these six qualities is the typical Dharma Patni. I am not here to question the definition of woman because every definition or every shloka or Every piece of literature can be reviewed depending on the present settings. The meanings change. We can't fix upon a particular meaning, as Derrida says. So there is a free play of meaning as the ages advance. As time goes by, we begin to reinterpret texts in a different light. And that is exactly what we are looking at. So this definition of a woman this so-called patriarchal definition of a woman i do not wish to speak in terms of man and woman alone when i say you know a mythopoic narrative and woman as subaltern i am not looking at man as the enemy definitely not i'm not looking at man as what do i say the victimizer no definitely not i'm looking at the patriarchal society in general where men and women are party to it i'm definitely not here to say that you know uh, feminism means a movement against men because in my opinion every human being who believes that a woman should be treated with respect who believes that a woman should be treated with dignity and who believes that women are worthy of respect and dignity is a feminist irrespective of gender male female or she male and every human being the converse is equally true every human being who believes that women are not worthy of respect that they are after all subordinates is a misogynist irrespective of gender so with this let me start off i hope this webinar throws light on what best I wish to reveal. Within the time frame of let's say 45 minutes, I will try my best to throw light on what best I can do. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail on the concept of the subaltern. I'll just give you the basics. Now we all know that the term subaltern was coined by Antonio Gramsci. What does the term subaltern refer to? It refers to a person or a group of people that belong to a comparatively inferior rank. And because they belong to the so-called inferior rank, they are victims of hegemony. Now, what do you mean by hegemony? When one group dominates another group, in the broad sense, we call it hegemony. But hegemony is not just that. When one group uses certain ideologies to validate and justify its domination over another group, that is when you really have hegemony in its truest form. So when, you know, the, uh, the upper class or the capitalists, 
subjugate the working class, the egalitarians, the proletariat. What are they doing? They use a set of ideologies wherein, you know, they are put, the capitalists are put on a top front and the working class comes at the bottom of the ladder or the bottom of the scale. So using ideology to justify what you're doing, that is hegemony. So because of this hegemonic domination, what happens? The subaltern is denied the basic rights of participation. What do you mean by participation? You cannot be at the forefront. You definitely can't. You usually slink into the shadows or you work behind the screens. Okay? So as far as history is concerned, as far as culture is concerned, again, you slink into the shadows or if at all you are presented, you are presented only to highlight the importance of the hegemonic classes. So this is the problem with subaltern and inequality. Remember, as I told you, that is the whole idea of hegemony. Inequality is validated and justified. So this is the main concept of the subaltern, the marginal, the oppressed, the downtrodden in every sense, the socially downtrodden. So now let me carry this forward. Now, why did I say woman as subaltern? Number one, because women are considered subordinates in the patriarchal setup. Again, I'm not saying man, I'm referring to it as patriarchy because women are also party to the whole thing. It is not just man who is party to it. And again, why? Because there is hegemonic domination in the name of patriarchy. And if at all woman is portrayed in culture, in history, in mythology, it is only to highlight the greatness of patriarchy. Either woman succumbs to patriarchy and acknowledges the patriarchal power as the ultimate power, except in those forms where, for example, if you look at mythology, the Shakta worship brought out Shakti, the Devi Bhagavatam, which is the epitome of Shakta worship, portrays woman as the center. So except those texts which center on women, most of the texts are male-centered, androcentric, patriarchal, and everything is portrayed only from that perspective. So this is why woman and subalternity have been fused together here. Now, when Spivak asked the question, can the subaltern speak? And when she said, no, they cannot speak. It doesn't mean that the subaltern is dumb. That is not what Spivak intended. That is definitely not what a great post-colonial scholar like Gayatri Spivak intended. She said there is no strong or concrete body of critical inquiry to delve into this concept of the subaltern. So without a proper, you know, form of critical inquiry, the subaltern really cannot voice its true feelings its feelings cannot be felt the way it should be or the way they should be. So with these points, let me move on to the next point. I said a peek into the mythopoic narrative. Now let me first bring up the distinction between myth and mythopoia. Now the first point is the sacred versus the profane. I put a question mark because this concept of Myth being sacred and any tampering with it considered profane is a big question mark. Scholars are still debating. For example, Karen Armstrong in her book, A Short History of Myth says, myths are never in the same place and myths are never in the same form and shape. They keep shifting. They are shape shifting 
concepts, myths. Because every era, every age perceives myth in a new light. So a myth can never remain the same. It has to indulge in shape shifting, structure shifting, form shifting. But there are purists. For example, Marcia Elliott believes in the concept of the myth. He says that, you know, the myth is considered sacred. One doesn't tamper with the myth. So we have mixed views on this. So if you're looking at myth versus mythopoeia, are we looking at the sacred? Because it deals with divinity and the profane. Another reason why I would call it the so-called profane is if you look at Kalidasa's Kumara Sambhava, the first seven cantos are available to you. But the eighth canto onwards, most of it is not available. Particularly, the eighth canto is considered taboo. And in most places, even if you look up the internet, it is not easily available. You have to pay money in order to access it. It is called Uma Surata Varnana, meaning the pleasures of Uma. It talks about the sex between Shiva and Uma. And sex between the gods is considered taboo. So who was Kalidasa, a mere mortal, to delve into those realms of the gods? So that was considered a very profane rendering. And that is why that particular canto is never easily available on the internet. You, know, you try looking up. And even among books, you want to go for printed books, it's not so easily available. So next we move on to creation versus recreation. So creation, the original myth. We don't know when the original myth originated. For example, you look at the Mahabharata or the Ramayana, you have oral tellings. Even before Vyasa's version came up, there were oral tellings of Nala and Damayanti and of all other characters. So, we don't know when the original myth was really created. But as far as Mythopoeia is concerned, it is recreation of the myth. Creating either an entirely new myth like Tolkien did or modifying existing myths so creation versus recreation now the next point the divine versus the anthropomorphic now what exactly do i mean by this now the myth always tries to focus on divinity as the center as the focal point as the pivotal point so any action performed by the divine or the demigod or the hierophanic, the physical embodiment of divinity, the hierophanic protagonist is always seen as divine. Any action only highlights the divine quality. Now, in the mythopoeic narrative, Every action only tries to bring out the human in that character, the anthropomorphic, the humanistic tendencies in that character. What are the typical human tendencies in that particular character? This is what the mythopoeic narrative tries to bring about. The next point is magic, the supernatural. So it is a world of the supernatural. It is a world of fantasy, divine fantasy. Okay. So against the backdrop, against the background of divine fantasy, against the background of, you know, magic, against the background of divinity, against the background of supernatural elements, you have the events unfolding. You have a few elements of realism, but mostly it is a lofty theme of the supernatural, divine supernatural. In mythopoeic narratives, it follows a transition from magic to magic realism or a legend. The best example of a legend is Bahubali. Okay, the novelization of Bahubali is seen in Anand Nilakantan's novel, the first of the trilogy, The Rise of Sivagami, which I will be discussing today. So, either in the mythopoeic narrative, from myth, you move on to a legend, an unverified or a totally fictitious historical legend, 
or you move on to magic realism against the backdrop against the background of reality you have some reference to magic elements as we see in forest of enchantments as we see in palace of illusions as we see in lanka's princess as we see in sita's sister to an extent so all this is what you really need to take into account when you're looking at myth versus mythopoeia now next divine destiny versus luck or power now whatever happens in the epics whatever happens in the so called myths the original myths is an act of the supreme it is an act of god and there is always the element of fantasy there is always the element of magic to show that divine destiny always interferes for example in the myth of nala and damayanti when karkotaka the royal sir you know the archetypal king of serpents stings nala he becomes crooked and uh, ugly and he says why did you do this to me and karkotaka says you're a great scholar of sanskrit i asked you to count from 1 to 10 don't you know that in sanskrit the word dasha has two meanings one means 10 and the other means sting so i only followed your instructions and when nala says why did you do this i saved you from the fire he says no you didn't save me from anything it was just destiny you were only fulfilling an aspect of destiny and he gives him robes he says the day you want to change into your usual form wear these magical robes and you will change into your form and by that time the shani in you lord shani who is literally you know taken hold of you would have left you and you will be blessed with prosperity so divine destiny and whatever happens in the mythopoeic narrative is either due to luck or due to power which is also considered a part of destiny but in the case of the original myth it is the divine destiny not just the ordinary destiny that rules human beings now the next point in myth the focus is on the ruling powers the elite but in the mythopoeic narrative it is the subaltern the marginal that is focused upon so that brings us to the center and the marginal so these are the differences between myth and mythopoeia so with these let me move on to the next point now i found this very fascinating so why am i focusing on woman as subaltern and what is the need for woman to express her views through writing now in forest of enchantments the sage valmiki valmiki maharishi gives sita the ramayan the story of ram and he tells her ma please read this because it is a story of yours as well so she spends all her night with it and the next morning she says yes you have described the wedding you have described uh, the banishment to the forest you have described uh, the slaying of ravana you have described everything but but she's angry she says you have not described what i felt when i first came to ayodhya as a newly wedded bride how i felt when i was in panchavati how i felt when i moved from one place to another with my husband when he was not behaving like the ruler or the prince who had princely duties but merely as my husband when i was the most beloved woman in creation and he says i wrote what the vision showed me and she says then it must have been a god who gave you the vision a an androcentric a male god not a goddess because you haven't understood what a woman's feelings are it is very difficult for you to really think like a woman you really haven't understood what it is to be a, like a woman to feel like a woman to write like a woman and so he says you must write your story and please note now the planets were shifting everything was about to change again so 
I found these lines highly memorable because this, in turn, borders on the kind of intertextuality that the empire, the woman's empire, is beginning to write back. The woman's empire is beginning to question the ideals, the morals that existed in myths. So usually when you read post-colonial texts, you talk about the two concepts of abrogation and appropriation. Abrogation is where you refuse to accept the colonizer's language as the center, where you try to spice the colonizer's language with, uh, you know, local idioms and phrases, with terms directly from the mother tongue, like for example, angavastram, ayo, terms like these. And appropriation is where you use the colonizer's language to attack the colonizer, to use the colonizer's language as a whiplash against the colonizer. But here the whiplash is turning inward. Why? One possibility is that, number one, here, man or the patriarchal society is seen as the colonizer and woman is seen as the colonized. That is one possible explanation. The second possible explanation is when you say post-colonial literature, number one, it deals with a country which is suffering under the colonial burden. That could be one theme or that is one possible theme in post-colonial literature. The second is, you know, the... The literary text focuses on the after effects of colonialism, the post-colonial experience. After colonialism, has the colony moved back to normalcy? Is it better now or is it in worse conditions now? That is another theme. The third theme is by writers, you know, on various topics. The only difference that, uh, you know, kind of sets them apart from other writers from non-post-colonial countries is that they are writing from a country which was under colonial rule. So if you ask me, why are we exploring our myths again? Are we using a whiplash against ourselves? Yes, this is because this is one of the social concerns now in post-colonial discourse. Now, I will tell you what exactly I intend to do. I wish to because I have very less time, I wish to apply Giddens' structuration theory to some of the mythopoetic texts and to show you how possibly you can use a framework. I'm not saying that you should restrict it to a framework. You can use it as a framework to analyze a text. Now, Anthony Giddens was the exponent of the structuration theory. He's an anthropologist, a sociologist, and he said structures are the pillars of ideology. Now, when you say structure, now what you see in that clip is an example of one of the structures of ideology. Family. You see the mother polar bear watching her cubs playing. She knows that they're just playing with each other. Although, you know, to somebody who doesn't stand, it may be as if they're playing. No, they're actually playing. But the mother polar bear knows when things will go out of control. When things get out of control, one growl is enough from her to set them in place. So family, education, religion, culture, history, all these are structures or pillars of ideology. So they control the agents. It could be the ruling class and the subaltern. But the same structure or the pillar of ideology conveys different meanings to different groups. Obviously, it goes without saying that to the ruling class, the structure may be binding in most cases, but it is mostly a convenient form for them. And for the subaltern, it is highly oppressive. This is what happens with structures. And according to Giddens, uh, there are Madam, yeah, yeah, yeah everything okay there was uh your ppt was stuck now it is okay madam you continue continue okay. madam so there are three dominant structures did i was something struck were you able to see giddens were you able to see the slide on giddens uh dr somali were you able to see the slide on giddens was it stuck there yes ma'am it's fine it's fine ma'am. Ma okay 
So there are three dominant structures that Giddens talks about. Number one, signification, meaning in communication. And when we say communication, it refers to all forms of media. It refers to literature in its oral and written form. So in signification, how is ideology supported? How does it favor the ruling class? And how does it not favor the subaltern? So in signification, what happens? In domination, through power, how is the subaltern subdued? And legitimation. So the ruling class is allowed certain privileges, which the subaltern is never allowed. So these are the pillars of ideology. Now next I pass on to George Ridzer, who is also another anthropologist and sociologist. Now he presents eight dimensions of structuration. Now here, these eight dimensions of structuration focus on the agents, meaning he is not focusing on the ruling class or the elite, the privileged, the center. He focuses on the margin, the marginal or the subordinate or the subaltern. Okay, so in the subaltern, in the book, the subaltern Indian woman, you have this structure described in detail. So this is the first dimension that the agents passively examine their action as well as their social and physical contexts, meaning they understand their true situation in society. They understand their true space in society. They reckon with their own sense of proxemics in society. Now, here is an example. So, Sita wonders why Valmiki wants her to read, you know, the Ramayana and to pass her comments on it. And look at her, you know, this is how she views herself. A queen bereft of her kingdom. She is no longer the queen of Ayodhya. A wife rejected by her husband at the height of his glory. Rama Rajya, the golden era. And at this particular stage, you know, she's rejected. She has nothing. And when she came to Valmiki's hermitage, she was pregnant. She, except for the life that she carried within her, she had nothing. And she now has nothing except her children. So she passively examines her contexts. Now, this is from The Rise of Sivagami. Now, in the novel, The Rise of Sivagami, Sivagami, who in Bahubali is the queen mother, the Rajmata. In Bahubali, before the beginning, now before the beginning, what do you have? You have only chaos. And that is exactly what is presented in Mahishmati. Okay? In Mahishmati, you have almost a dystopian setup. And there is corruption, there is prostitution, you have uh, conspiracy, everything in the air. And even the royal family is not free from it. The prince Bijala is absolutely corrupt. He's, you know, full of carnal lust. So it is against this backdrop that you have Anand Nilakantan, a male writer, presenting Sivagami as the protagonist. And Sivagami's father was a traitor. He was deemed a traitor. Okay? So he was deemed a traitor. Devaraya. Bhumipati. He occupied a very important position in the government as Bhumipati. So he was deemed a traitor. He was caged. He was left on top of a tree, caged. He was made to starve and crows and vultures were allowed to peck his body. So this was the kind of gruesome death that he was subject to by the king, Somadeva. So look at, you know, Sivagami's plight. She sent to the royal orphanage by her, you know, father's close friend, another Bhumipati Tinma. And Timma says, please don't think I don't want you. I'm doing this for the purpose. So when she's taken to the, you know, the royal orphanage, which is so bleak and so bad, even there, Revamma, who runs the orphanage, says, what sin has my father done? 
What sin have I committed that I should take care of a traitor's daughter? Why should I nurse a snake? So no one wanted her, not even the warden of an orphanage. So to be unwanted, the height of subalternity, to be unwanted, to be rejected in society. So Timma says, look, there is a reason, but you have to leave my house and go to the royal orphanage. He doesn't want her. Society doesn't want her because she's a traitor's daughter. And even at the orphanage, when the Mahapradhana, the prime minister, came, comes to leave her, Revamma, who's the warden, she says, I don't want, Swami, don't do this to me. I have taken care of, you know, the martyrs of Mahishmati, the children of the martyrs of Mahishmati. Why should I take care of a traitor's daughter? And again, in Lanka's princess, look at Shurpanaka. Her father, Vaishravas, likes Vibhishan. Her mother, Kaikeshi, likes Ravan. And, you know, she looks at them fighting over their favorites. And she feels all the more rejected. She actually tried to, you know, defend her brother from being bullied and beaten up by another bully called Som. And she has wealth so all over her body because she fought with that boy. But her parents are not concerned about her wounds or her welts or whatever. They are fighting only over their favorites. So to be rejected as a child, to be the unwanted child. So the agents understand their situation. They view their situation passively at first. This is the second one. Developing a sense of rationalization. For example, in Lanka's princess, Shurpanaka develops her own rationalization. She tries to, you know, merge more with the forest, acculturate more with the forest. And she tries, without her father's knowledge, to learn magic from her grandmother, Tadaka. And in the case of the Forest of Enchantments, you have Devakaruni introducing Sita as a healer, a natural healer, and a person who's green-fingered. She's very good at making plants grow. So this is the second point. They develop a kind of rationalization. Now, using your practical sense to do something or to make something happen. For example, in the Palace of Illusions, I had mentioned this incident during another webinar. When Draupadi is brought home, you know, to the god, the queen mother Kunti. The first thing she tells her is here, cook some brinjal. That's the first job she gives her. And you know, she doesn't know what to do. And uh, you know, the queen mother is looking at her with a smirk on her face. And she says, maybe you're burning the brinjals. Now this is an incident introduced to highlight anthropomorphism, to indulge in character delineation, to highlight the character of Draupadi and also of Kunti. So, Draupadi now realizes that she must rise to the occasion. She uses her practical knowledge. She remembers what the sorceress had trained her when she was a princess in the palace of King Draupad. And using the powers of magic that the sorceress taught her, she cooks a wonderful brinjal curry. So, using your practical consciousness, having a great presence of mind to rise to the occasion. So this is what the agents do. In spite of being subaltern, these are the qualities that they exhibit. Now, unintended consequences. See, life is not so predictable, isn't it? You have, take a look at that iceberg. It all seems very strong, but see, within minutes, the whole thing crumbles to nothing. So it's an unintended consequence natural consequence happening, a natural process happening. So when you have a sudden situation presented, when you have, uh, you know, an unexpected consequence occurring, then you will find how these agents, these women interact with the structure. Now what happens in Palace of Illusions, this is what happens. Duryodhan actually walks over an illusory bridge. He thinks it's a bridge, but there is no bridge and he falls into the water. And even Draupadi is tickled to smile, according to Palace of Illusions. 
<coughs> in the original version of the Mahabharata, it is believed that she teases Duryodhana directly. But here, in the mythopoetic narrative, it is not she who teases. It is one of her maids who teases Duryodhana and says, you know, it seems the blind king's son is also blind. And, you know, she thinks, God, I should have called out my apologies. She should have sent her maids with dry clothes. And she should have punished the girl who had spoken. You know, you know, she thinks she should have done that. But when she looks at the anger on Karna's face, she also becomes defiant. Why should I bow before these people? Let me keep quiet. So, you know, she keeps quiet. And she does nothing about it. Now, agents have the capacity to transform conditions. This is another dimension. Now, if you look at Shashi Deshpande's short story, Mirrors. According to the original myth of Nahush, Nahush is cursed to become a serpent. Nahush is asked to become the king of heaven when Devendra is under the curse of Brahmahatti. He kills Vrutasur, who was created by Rishi. When you're created by the Rishi, you become the, the Rishi's offspring. You become the Rishi's child. So killing a Rishi's creation meant killing a Brahmana. So he was cursed with Brahmahatti. So he had to undergo penance underwater in a lotus stem. So Nahash was asked to be the king of heaven. At first he was virtuous, as he always had been. But later on, he became blinded by lust. He said, if I am Indra, then Shachi or Indrani should be mine. And he tells her, you should submit to me. And Indrani, as a woman, is not able to retaliate or do anything because she has limited powers. So, you know, according to the original myth, Brahaspati, convinces her, he counsels her, he says, ask Nahush to come to your harem, your Antapura, in a palanquin, in a palki, or palak, as you call it, you know, carried by the Saptarishis. And Nahush is so blinded by lust, he wants them to move faster. And the Rishis are not used to such manual labor. He puts his foot out and kicks and says, Sarpa, Sarpa, meaning move faster. Agastya Muskit turns and says, How blinded by lust are you that you have forgotten all sense of morals? You have crossed all boundaries of morals. May your very words be your destiny. May you become a sarpa. And he's cursed to be a serpent. And in the Mahabharat, when he calls around Bhima and when Yudhishthir tells him, the qualities of a king, the qualities of a good human being, on listening to it, he's released from his curse. But in mirrors, that is not the way it goes. It is Ashoka Sundari, a totally unknown character, Nahush's wife, who's never mentioned in any of these stories. In fact, Deshpande also says you have no place in any myth. So it is Ashoka Sundari. Even there, her name is not mentioned. It is Ashoka Sundari, Nahush's wife, who gives... Indrani, this idea, not Brahaspati, not Indra, as some myths say. It is Ashoka Sundari who gives Shachi the idea that you should come like this. And there is no curse this time. You know what they do as they cross the valley and when Nahush kicks Agastya, Agastya nods to the others, they take the palki near the valley and they tilt it. So Nahush is filled with fear and he screams a helpless scream in vain so they have the capacity to transform conditions and when indra comes back shachi says now he's okay with me now he's very nice to me but if he once again goes to rape women and to do things to women which are not which is not right then another revolution will not take time to come meaning what happened to nahush can happen to him as well so look at this in Lanka's princess. When Kuber tries to take her as hostage, Meenakshi, that is Shurpanaka, that is her original name, Meenakshi, and Chandranaka, because her nails were like the crescent moon. So Chandranaka or Meenakshi scratches him and he calls her Hellcat. 
you know, so she can take care of herself. She can transform conditions. And this is what happens in the case of Shivagami. She's trained in martial arts. And what happens is that in Revamma's orphanage, girls who cross 16 or 17 are sold off into the flesh trade. And the corrupt officials say that they have volunteered to become Devadasis. So when Keki, the eunuch, tries to, you know, uh, press her friend Kamakshi's breasts and say, ah, are you ready now to come with us to Kalika? Kalika is a prostitute to her den. She grabs her head and she, you know, tries to threaten her with a knife. And remember, when a woman tries to unleash her power, look at the name she gets, witch, devil, demoness. That is the kind of name that a woman gets when she tries to safeguard herself. Again, as I told you, when you have structure, it has rules and regulations. But these mean something different for the ruling class and something different for the subaltern. For example, Sita in Forest of Enchantments. She is shown as one who's trained in martial arts. And there is one incident where she also succeeds in her duel against Kaikei. And she goes to meet Rajamata Kaikei. Okay? So, she can take care of herself. When Shurpanaka lunges for Sita, saying, Aha, you're the one who's standing between me and Ram. Uh, you know, Ram says, Lakshman, you must protect her. But she says, no. She may be a Rakshasi, but I know how to take care of myself. But even before she can do something, remember when she duels with Kaikei, she says, if you hurt me, okay, you have won. But in my case, if I just make sure that you are disarmed, if the weapon flies out of your hands, then I have won. She doesn't want to hurt. She doesn't want to hurt anybody. So she doesn't want to hurt Shurpanaka. She only wants to disarm her. But before she can even think of something, the harm is done. So, again, Shachi, as long as she was Indra's wife and when Indra was the king, the patriarchal society protects her. And again, in Karna's wife, the outcast queen, Bakavita Kane, Urvi, she enjoys her own privileges as Karna's queen. So, there are privileges which the subaltern of the upper class enjoy. Some of it is supporting, but some of it is highly restraining. Now, what happens here? Actually, there are three boys in the orphanage who try to attack Sivagami and her friend Kamakshi. Sivagami does not submit. She fights back because she's trained in martial arts. Okay? Now, I want you to note these points. She did not start the fight. But what does Revama say? Revamma was screaming her head off, saying the daughter of the traitor had killed her boys. Nothing happened. She only defended herself, killed. It's reached that stage. Sivagami walked by her without even bothering to glance at her. A Rakshasi, a Yakshi. Or how else can she defeat me? Only God can save us from this witch. Look at the stigma that... A woman who tries to portray herself, project herself, gets. See, uh, you had a very, uh, you know, enriching uh, session from Dr. Pallavi Gupta, where the reference to Jane Eyre was made. If you read Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubers, The Mad Woman in the Attic, the reference is to Bertha Mason, the mad woman in the attic, who dies, and Jane Eyre, who succeeds in the end in marrying Rochester. Now, the mad woman, according to Gilbert and Guber, refers to the woman who tries to raise her voice in society, who tries to come up in society. And such a woman is always seen as unwanted. So, Jane Eyre seems a feminist text, but actually it only adheres to the so-called patriarchal practices. That is why Bertha Mason dies in the end and Jane Eyre succeeds in having a happy ending. So this is the stigma that falls upon the subaltern, particularly the woman. Now, when you talk about structure as a social routine, what happens? A reproduced social routine. 
and mostly these routines stem from unanticipated, unexpected consequences. For example, Dashratha was extremely attached to Kaikeyi. He loved her more than any of his wives, Kaushalya or Sumitra. So what happened? Because of this undue love, one fine day what happened? Kaikeyi, you know, sulked. And she went into a separate chamber called the anger chamber or the angry chamber. So what happened there? It became a routine after that, that whenever she wanted something from the king, she walked into that anger chamber. And Dasharat made it a point to go and plead with her outside her door and say, please, I will, you know, agree to whatever you do. This is in Forest of Enchantments. And this is the same rules she plays. It is the same action she reproduces to banish Ram to the forest and to have Bharat crown as the king. And the same sulking action is reproduced by Urmila. When Lakshman leaves Sita in the forest and does not breathe a word about it to anybody, Urmila resorts to the same technique. After four days of anger, when Lakshman literally pleads with her, please drink this milk. And then she says, okay, I will drink it provided you give me information about Sita. So, you know, again in the case of Gautam Rishi, Ahalya decides to, after she's changed once again into a woman, after being cursed to be a stone for no fault of hers, she decides to take a vow of silence. Now, what is this vow of silence? Is it her way of punishing her husband, of shutting him out of her system while still taking care of his needs? So it is a reproduced social routine. He cut her off from all communication by making her a stone. So she is a living stone now to him. She doesn't talk at all. So again, reiterating Raj Dharma. When Dasharat had to follow his Dharma of a Kshatriya by keeping his promise. Again, Ram has to follow his Raj Dharma. When his citizens are unhappy, he banishes Sita to the forest. And once again, towards the end, he says, can you once again take an Agni Pariksha before the others? She says, enough is enough. I cannot do it anymore. And she asks the earth to claim her. The concept of banishment, again, reproduced. Dasharat banishing Ram to the forest and Ram repeating the same in banishing Sita to the forest. So these are reproduced social routines. And the next is time and space are very important. For example, in uh, the Forest of Enchantments, you have a 28-year-old, uh, you know, a 28-year space mentioned. Okay, time and space mentioned. You have the forest, you have Ayodhya, you have, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the garden of Ravana, you have the palace of Ravana, and then you have the forests where Valmiki takes care of her. So you have time and space playing a very important role in structuration theory because space is not just physical, it is also psychological. In Sita's mind, there are a lot of things that she has access to. She can, uh, you know, her dreams give her a wider space to understand life. Her dreams, you know, kind of predict what is going to happen to her. And for her, Shurpanaka, her space is her forest where she has, she is at home. And for Sivagami, her space is in her mind at a time when Mahishmati will be doomed to destruction. She wants to take revenge against Mahishmati. So these are the eight dimensions. The reason why I chose this is I just wanted to give you a sample framework by which you can really understand a particular theory. So thank you very much. <coughs> for giving me the opportunity. I'll be very happy. Uh, yes, so, madam. Fine. Yes, madam. Thank you so much, madam, for such a brilliant and excellent as well as a pictorial presentation. Uh, it was an eye-catching and mind-blowing one, madam. And uh, there are so many participants who are asking questions. Uh, the questions will be displayed on your screen, madam. Let me do it. Uh, can you see, ma'am? Okay. 
Amisha Tripathi Shiva trilogy again. Now, you don't have magic mentioned in, uh, that's a good question because I really love that part of Shiva trilogy. Now, Sita, warrior of Mithila. Again, you find Amish Tripathi moving from myth into a legend or more or less something that borders on a historical narrative. For example, you have Shiva being the leader of a tribe and you also have the qualities of a hero built into him. For example, the neck. When they see him as Neelakant, they, they build a myth around him. You know, Amish Tripathi talks about how Mithupaya takes place. And there again, you see how much of respect Shiva gives to women. You know, in the beginning, he's quite vagrant in his ways and all that. But later on, how he respects women, how he accepts Sati, although she's, uh, you know, she's widowed and uh, she gave birth to a Vikarma child and all that. So if you look at the Shiva trilogy, you will find that Mithapoya is seen more as a legend. It is more in terms of a legend. And again, if you look at Sita, warrior of Mithila, Ravana, the enemy of the tribe, you know, if you look at all this, this borders more on a historical legend. Yeah. Well, is there a resemblance between Asura by Anand? See, in uh, Ramayana Saga's Ramayana, what actually happened was, it was like Milton's paradise lost. Milton did not want to project Satan in a positive light. But he got so carried away by his presentation, by his portrayal of Satan, but that he realized at some point that Satan was going to dominate. In fact, Satan is the one who really dominates Paradise Lost more than anybody else. You know, and that was precisely what, uh, you know, the, uh, the writer did not want, the poet did not want. See, this happens in most cases when the character overpowers the writer. Agatha Christie said the same about Poirot, Hercule Poirot. She did not want Poirot to be so popular, but the character went out of control for her. So if you look at uh, Raman and Saga's Ravan, although he wanted to project Ram in a more positive light, uh, sadly speaking, Ravan became very popular. Arvind Trivedi, who played the role yes, yes. of Ravan, became very popular. So that is how, but Anand Neelakantan deliberately portrays, uh, you know, um, Ravan in a different light in order to make you understand that this is one of the ways in which you should be seeing Ravan. But in the case of Raman and Sagar, it exceeded his expectations. That is the main difference. Yes, yes, yes. That yes. is not the intention. The authorial intention or the creator's intention was not that. But Anand Neelakantan's intention was to look at Ravana in a different light, in a different perspective. Uh, another one, ma'am? Yes, please. Well, any literature of violence, you know, definitely goes towards saying that violence is inflicted by the strong upon the weak. It goes without saying. And uh, in fact, the Times of India brought out uh, an article saying, is domestic violence the next pandemic? You know, because... Yes. The, the, the number of cases of domestic violence seem to be on the rise. And Uttarakhand, within just 10 days of the pandemic, registered more than 1,300 cases yes, of yes. domestic violence. So any narrative or discourse of violence definitely shows that it is inflicted by the stronger on the weaker. So obviously, it has every scope of subalternity. Yeah, madam, you're of, of course right. The domestic violence cases are increasing day by day and particularly in this lockdown period it's the uh, harsh truth yes, uh, yes ma'am uh, another one is there okay now mythology is from a structuralist perspective as far as roland Barthes is concerned he presents a dichotomy between nature and culture he talks about 
what nature is and he differentiates it from culture. Please note that Marx was not talking at the drop of a hat. If you look at the evolution of man from nature, we evolve into culture. If you look at the history of mankind, in the Paleolithic period or the early, or the old Stone Age period, man was a hunter. So he used weapons, he carved weapons out of stone, he used, he, he was a hunter basically and between groups where there were fights, he was a warrior. So the rule of nature presided as far as the Paleolithic period was concerned. Okay, in the Mohalithic yes. period, forests were cleared and agriculture took over. It was not just the taking over of agriculture, along with it, a lot of societies, different societies began to form. Some of them prefer to live in the forests only, but some of them moved to the cities or the so-called towns which were created, the settled land that was created. And along with that, culture evolved. So one man with one woman. You know, and yes. this is the whole idea of mythology that Baths tries to bring about from a structuralist perspective. Uh, Madam, one last question, uh, though it is a little uh, different from that meat. Definitely it is double colonization of women, definitely. See, this is exactly what uh, Pallabi was talking about, Dr. Pallabi was talking about, she was talking about black women. See, mm -hmm. as it is in the early period, when Lincoln and Roosevelt and Martin Luther King were really voicing their, you know, opinions on equality for all, on, you know, ruling out the discrimination between the white and the black. Yes. <coughs> black women, the so-called black women writers or African women writers, African American women writers said that we are doubly colonized, we are doubly oppressed because while men are definitely oppressed okay we are not just oppressed as by the by our color and race we are also oppressed by our gender so it is definitely a case of double colonization there's no doubt about it at all yes madam one question i yeah. like to answer this yeah yeah of course rakshanda naim uh, it's a very interesting question on how can magic and realism exist together it isn't it an oxymoron of course it is an oxymoron. That is what is life, isn't it? In the Vishnu Sahasra Nama, what is the what is one of what does one of the lines say? Punarapi Jananam, Punarapi Maranam, Punarapi Janani Jagale Shayanam. So Punarapi Jananam, Punarapi Maranam. So it's it's cyclic. See, don't life and death coexist in society? Don't happiness and sorrow coexist in society? Why can't magic and realism coexist in society then? Yes, yes, yes. So it, Fine, it madam. Uh, so, thank you very much, madam, for this uh, beautiful interactive session. Uh, it was a wonderful one, and it seems that we got a, a kind of an aesthetic pleasure going through your presentation. It was so eye-soothing and mind-blowing, and it was a kind of a sensuous pleasure, whatever we have got from your particular presentation. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, we just, uh, from the core of our hearts, we uh, pay our sincere gratitude to you. And probably you have a meeting also. Uh, and uh, very good yeah. luck for your um, future endeavor, ma'am. In the future, we will much. remain in touch with you. Thank you so much, madam. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Uh, Devjani, madam, uh, welcome to you uh, in this particular webinar. Can you hear me, ma'am? Devjani, ma'am. But, uh, madam, your your face is not visible, madam. You just, uh, madam, you are. Devjani, ma'am. Devjani, madam, you have to.
uh, dear participants please be with us uh, probably madam has some problem with her connection Can you see me now? Yeah, madam, you are visible and audible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you, you hear so me? I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, there was some problem with the Wi-Fi, and I'm extremely apolo I apologize for it. Uh, it's not a problem, madam. Uh, we heartily welcome you, ma'am, in our webinar. Thank you uh, so much, Somali. Yeah. Uh, let me introduce you, ma'am, to the audience. Hmm. Devjani Shengupta studied in Jadupur University for her MA and completed her doctoral dissertation from the Center of Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She is the author of the Partition of Bengal, Fragile Borders and New Identities, who, which is published by Oxford University Press in the year 2015 and has edited uh, another book, titled Looking Back, The Partition of India, 70 Years On, by Orient Black Swan in the year 2017. Her more recent publication is Women's Writings from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, The Worlds of Bangla and Urdu, that she has co-edited with Raksanda Jalil, published by uh, Bloomsbury in the year 2019. Her translations from Bangla, have been author, uh, anthologized in the Oxford India Anthology of Bengali Literature and in Harvard University Press's Essential Tagore. Currently, Professor Shen Gupta is an associate professor in the Department of English in the Prastha College for Women, University of Delhi. Today, Madam will enlighten us all about the topic Partitions, Borders, Memory and Labor in short fictions from Assam and Tripura. Madam, the platform is yours. Please continue, ma'am. Thank you so much, Somali. I want to first uh, uh, thank the Department of English, uh, Women's College Agartala for inviting me. I have been logging on to some of the uh, topics um, of discussion and um, uh, enjoying myself hugely as I'm sure uh, many of you are who are uh, uh, listening in as audience. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the two uh, conversations we have heard in the morning um, uh, are um, actually very different from what I'm going to talk about now. And uh, I'm going to talk about instead of myth and uh, uh, magic, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, partition and, and the 1947 partition of India and um, I'm going to talk specifically of uh, uh, a few uh, sto uh, two stories actually from one from Assam and one from Tripura because I thought that since um, the webinar is being hosted by a college in Tripura it would be um, um, uh, interesting to actually look at the literature of this region and uh, and and look at the idea of uh, what post-coloniality has meant um, uh, you know for the people of uh, what we call the umbrella term the northeast so i'm going to uh, 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 read from the stories um, uh, towards the end of my lecture um, and uh, but before that i would like to touch upon a few of the uh, uh, issues that i want i want to flag uh, to you and um, some of the and i want to historicize uh, you know uh, some of the these issues so that uh, when we are coming to the stories we can actually see some of these issues playing out um, in the narrative and emplotment of uh, 
these texts. So uh, what really interests me is um, that when I began studying about the partition of India, it was um, quite uh, interesting to see that a very large majority of people do not know that there was also a partition in the eastern part of the country. Um, uh, and Assam was bifurcated along with Bengal. Um, you know, mainly uh, in the 80s and 90s when partition studies uh, became uh, important as a discipline, you know, uh, the studies were mainly uh, uh, Punjab-centric. And um, there were very few people working on uh, the Eastern partition. Uh, there were, of course, lots of uh, work in Bangla um, and in, I'm sure, in other languages, other Indian languages from the Northeast. Um, um, but uh, there was, in English at least, you know, there were very few works which, uh, um, uh, which actually grappled with the, what it meant uh, for the people of this region. So uh, what, uh, what really interests me is the transformation of this large geographical area, which we call, which we loosely give this term, this uh, overarching term of Northeast. You know, for in the colonial times, uh, uh, the Northeast was a frontier area. Um, and in 1947, in one fell uh, soup, uh, the frontier became the borderland. Uh, and uh, this is an aspect of India's partition that uh, has not been suitably addressed in our historiography. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So uh, the extensive uh, cartographical configurations that we see in this region, and I recollect Dr. Hussein's lecture yesterday, where he talked of, um, you know, uh, uh, post-coloniality in terms of the margin and the center, and um, how um, uh, 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 geographical uh, area becomes also a kind of how he talked about the aesthetics of geography uh, and geographical site and I'm, I'm particularly very interested in these two um, issues so uh, if you look at the extensive cartographical configurations uh, that results from uh, the partition of the country in 1947 uh, particularly if you look at uh, uh, the northeast then um, you certainly uh, see issues of ethnicity, identity, language, and belonging uh, are becoming very central uh, to the region's um, social and political and cultural life. So therefore, terms like citizens and aliens and infiltrators um, have become very loaded terms that often result in internecine bloodshed and various kinds of conflagrations between uh, who are seen as indigenous people, people belonging to this region, and people who are perceived as outsiders. Uh, I, and all these terms are within quotes. I'm not, I'm using them with a, a certain kind of uh, 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 <clears throat> Uh, interest, uh, literary as well as political interest. So, um, if you look at, if we look at the under, uh, genealogy and configuration of what is termed as India's northeastern region, we will see that it subverts some of the commonly held assumptions of the partition um, that um, uh, that are very popular in. Um, people's imagination. Uh, for instance, the communal polarization, the uh, polarization between Hindus and Muslims, um, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that borders are sacrosanct, the borders are um, well-defined and borders are sacrosanct um, and um, and uh, also that there are people who um, uh, belong within that border so all these assumptions about the partition uh, that the partition actually reconfigured the map um, 
of the re region and created these two nation states and later on three nation states after 71 it's uh, uh, Pakistan, India and Bangladesh. Earlier it was when the, uh, in 47 when India was divided it was East Pakistan and West Pakistan and after 71 it became uh, Pakistan, India and Bangladesh. So all these reconfiguration of the map uh, uh, you know began to um, come with its own baggage uh, you know and it's uh, and it was assumed and a lot of people assume um, you know it's very common in popular imagination that you know uh, 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 it was partition was a result of uh, the uh, fight between in, uh, Hindus and Muslims and uh, you know um, and uh, these well-defined nations had to be sort of uh, created to stop the bloodshed and murder and all that but when you look at the Northeast you know all these assumptions become extremely complex and complicated because when we are talking of um, regions in the Northeast we are also talking of a very large other Adivasi, uh, uh, indigenous Adivasi tribal population who had very little to do with Radcliffe's uh, lines and Radcliffe's boundaries and borders. So India's Northeast then after 47 becomes a prime example of the fissures uh, that existed in the post-colonial nation building project. So this project of creating a nation um, had a lot of anomalies. And, and when we look at the partition that took place in Bengal and in Assam, many of these anomalies come to the fore. And I'll talk about these um, in a little bit more detail. Um, so so the, the, the politics of ethnicity, uh, language, and citizenship um, uh, become very important issues. Um, uh, whereas in the rest of India, language is not a very important issue when we talk of the partition. You know, uh, India is uh, seen to be this kind of uh, uh, conglomeration of states, but uh, the partition did not happen because of linguistic nationalism. It happened because of religious nationalism. So the spatial and temporal realities that came into being in the Northeastern region through these post-colonial state-making practices have produced uh, uh, certain patterns of political and social unrest that we see even now. So partition is not something that began and ended in uh, it it con continues to draw blood and continues uh, to uh, 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 alienate uh, people uh, who are um, supposedly the citizens. So uh, if you look at, if if we look at, I'm sorry to use the word you, I, you know, I'm a teacher, so I always have this habit of saying you as if I'm addressing students. Please forgive me for that. Um, so if we look at the literature of the partition, um, we see that as of now, um, even till uh, four or five years ago, there was no understanding of any literature of the partition that has come from uh, the Northeastern region. Um, uh, and we cannot talk about the division of the country if we do not take into account um, the literature of Bangladesh, the literature of West Bengal, the literature of Assam, the literature of Tripura, and the literatures of other states like Meghalaya and Manipur. Unfortunately, I do not have uh, the language of these uh, 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 of, of, of these areas, and therefore my study has been exclusively on the Bangla uh, literatures of the region. But I am hoping that uh, some of you who are listening to my lecture may be interested in uh, delving. Uh, uh, in the future in, in some of the other languages which may have uh, produced a literature 
on uh, 47 and the affects the affective dimension of 47 um, you know in in languages other than uh, bangla and uh, hindi and english and urdu but some other languages so um uh, the trans-regional impact of the partition in this area is something that is very fascinating to me. And, and I am uh, interested in the complex contours of this trans-regional uh, impact, um, uh, particularly because if you remember that uh, uh, Assam was bifurcated, um, and um, the Silet division um, was um, uh, taken away from Assam and went to uh, East Pakistan. Uh, and uh, Tripura also have been um, uh, hugely affected uh, by, uh, uh, by 47. And I'll come to the historical, uh, 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 you know, contours in a while. So, uh, so uh, the exigencies and the calibrations of the modern post-colonial state, you know, when, if, if you look at the whole idea of the post-colonial state, um, they, uh, the, the discourse of the state making uh, the, uh, and, and nation making, nation building, the discourse of nation building and state making uh, often, has often hidden um, you know, the, the regional and the local fallouts of uh, the disruptions and dislocations of the partition. Uh, and, and we see a, a, a huge amount of, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are wandering uh, across borders a kind of rootless and migratory populations of varied ethnicities and religious affiliations who journey across these makeshift uh, national uh, borders uh, in search of livelihood and a place of sojourn. So um, I have chosen these two stories particularly because they display how post-coloniality is not just a process of, uh, you know, of how a nation state comes into being, um, resting itself, um, um, resting its freedom from a colonial uh, entity. It is not just a process, but it is a praxis. It is a practice. It is a practice of um, othering. Uh, and this is uh, seen, this is clearly seen in the detritus of marginal lives, refugee lives, or lives um, uh, lived on borders of the nation state um, that um, are seen um, that post-colonial political habits um, uh, constantly other and constantly marginalize. So if we are talking of post-coloniality as a process of the center and the margin, then I would ask uh, us to rethink this whole question and this whole business of who is the center and who is at the margin and how does the margin talk to the center or, or how does the center talk to the margin. So these are very interesting issues that, uh, you know, when we come to the northeastern region, they uh, become uh, 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 important for us to think about. And uh, the border, therefore, I, I mentioned in, uh, in my uh, title, is both real and figurative. Um, they are real because uh, they are international borders, uh, but they are also shadow lines. Uh, I am borrowing from Amita Ghosh um, that the state has drawn to uh, delineate its uh, 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 its citizens or mark an alien. So uh, uh, I'm very interested in what is the process of. Um, what is the what is the practice of post-coloniality, particularly when we come to the question of border and borderlands. Now, I will turn to the two stories that I am 
uh, uh, going to discuss. The first is um, a story uh, from Assam, from Borak Valley, uh, by a wonderful uh, uh, writer called Jhumur Pandey. And uh, this story that I am going to discuss is called Mukhoda Shundari Harana Prat. Um, uh, Mukhada Shundari is lost and found. It's a 2005 story from her collection, Shuk Gachir Golpo. And the second story is uh, by uh, Shunanda Bhattacharya, another wonderful writer from Tripura. Uh, and this story is called, uh, is taken from her. Uh, collection Poop Duari uh, that came out in 2014 and um, I have also translated uh, this uh, story so I'm going to when I discuss the story both the stories I'm going to uh, uh, read from my own translations uh, uh, unfortunately they have they are very little translations of uh, uh, People, uh, madam, madam, from... may I interrupt you for a yes, while? Yes. Uh, yes. Madam, just uh, speak a bit louder, ma'am. Oh, yes, of course, yeah. of course. Can you hear me now? Shall yeah, I... yeah, yeah, okay. ma'am. All right. Sorry, sorry, I will speak a little louder. So let me first talk about Tripura. Uh, and uh, then uh, I will come to Assam and give you a little bit of the history uh, before the 1947, before 1947, so that you know we can locate these stories as uh, uh, as uh, uh, belonging to a particular historical, social, and cultural context. Now, uh, uh, Tripura, uh, from the 13th century onwards, we see a huge influx of um, Bangla-speaking Hindus in the region from the time of the Manikko rulers from the 13th century um, and the uh, kings had always invited high caste educated Bengalis from other regions of undivided Bengal. This is undivided Bengal I'm talking about uh, to settle in the kingdom and they in turn received royal patronage uh, and, uh, and uh, it is not only the high caste Hindus but also uh, uh, agriculturalists both Hindus and Muslims have uh, come from East Bengal because uh, Tripura is, as you know, in the map, uh, very closely, <clears throat> it borders Bangladesh, uh, uh, that is East Pakistan earlier. And uh, uh, every time there was a kind of natural calamity, uh, agriculturalists, the migration of agriculturalists, both Hindus and uh, Muslims uh, 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 were very common because there were no borders in that sense in those times. And, and uh, these agriculturalists, of course, brought uh, the uh, wet rice uh, cultivation, uh, uh, whereas uh, the indigenous tribes uh, you know, followed shifting cultivation, agriculture. So the indigenous tribal population of the region, um, uh, uh, you know, have um, um, have uh, also been uh, kind of uh, 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 how shall I say in a sense uh, uh, the migration uh, at one point particularly after 47 um, uh, um, uh, uh, became quite large and uh, the indigenous tribal population of the region uh, 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 were barely half of the population and the newcomers were considered British subjects because this was undivided India, undivided British India. And uh, the newcomers were considered British subjects as opposed to the hill people who were not classified. I'm using uh, these census terms. They were not classified as uh, uh, into into uh, into uh, uh, different tribes, but even among the tribes, uh, there were significant differences. For instance, the Tripuri, the Riangs, uh, the Lusai, and the Kukis were indigenous to the region, whereas the Santals, the Lepchas, the
the Khasi and the Bhutia people uh, came to settle in the region in the 19th and the early 20th century uh, because of trade or other reasons. Remember, this is British India I'm talking about, and there were no um, uh, reason why people did not move, could not move, and they did move because of a number of reasons. Um, they wanted to find um, uh, virgin land to cultivate, they wanted to, to trade, uh, um, also um, they followed kin, um, kinship ties, so there were various reasons why people came into a region and settled there. So, um, also in 1946, when you see um, uh, the communal conflagration in the districts of Tipera and Noakhali, a large number of Hindu uh, Hindus were settled in uh, uh, various areas of Tripura under the patronage of Tripura's kings, um, Hindu kings, and um, and and in uh, 1947 when. Um, East Pakistan came into being, um, uh, the uh, kingdom of Tripura um, became a kind of buffer zone between East Pakistan and the rest of uh, the region. So in that sense, uh, you know, if you remember, Tripura shares 839 kilometers of border uh, with present-day Bangladesh. And, and this border is, I'm trying to say, is, is not a border like you have in the western part of the country, uh, where you have high barbed wire fences and a no man's land and all that. But this border is very porous. This border is, uh, and, and for many decades and many hundreds of years, people have crossed these borders because of uh, you know, various reasons. So, uh, so the the in uh, after 1947, the physical and geographical contiguity of uh, Tripura with East Pakistan meant that uh, refugee migration was almost a given. So, when I'm talking of refugee migration into Tripura, I'm talking of both uh, Hindus as well as Muslims. So, um, Tripura took a large amount of. Uh, uh, refugees, uh, you know, and uh, no systematic study has been actually done, except one or two. Gayatri Bhattacharya has a wonderful book on um, Tripura, but uh, very few work have been done on this. So, uh, uh, so um, for instance, um, in Assam, now let me just quickly go to Assam. Uh, uh, you all know, but before I just go to Assam, let me just quickly uh, flag that the period of uh, between the death of the last Manikku ruler in 1947 and the formation of the Tripura Ter Territorial Council in 1963, Tripura uh, is not a state of India till 1963, um, and uh, 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 and it is it, it is. Uh, it is much later that it becomes a state of uh, 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 India. Uh, so you see a co very competitive rise of spatial and territorial ethno-nationalism. Uh, uh, and this is a very interesting fact of Tripura's history, a, a, a kind of rise of a, a kind of ethno-nationalism between indigenous Tripuris, Bengali Muslims and Bengali Hindus about belonging and ideologies. So uh, uh, there has been a gradual demographic change in uh, Tripura's population. And um, uh, um, it, it, is, it, is, it is one of the effects of 1947, this demographic change. Now in Assam, um, uh, apart from uh, the same, almost the same trajectory of people entering Assam uh, can be seen from the 19th century, you know, when uh, uh, railways became very uh, uh, improved in, in this region. Colonial times, the Boran has been uh, home to a very large section of Sileti middle class um, uh, who were not refugees 
in the uh, sense that we talk about in partition studies. Uh, they uh, uh, were not, uh, their identity was not formed as a result of rivalry against Muslim, but in opposition to Assamese Hindus um, who had resented their elite status and government jobs that many had enjoyed from British times. So you see here again an assumption of 1947 being overturned that you know 47 is about the uh, um, uh, uh, rivalry between hindus and muslims it's not so in 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 silat and in the borat valley it is between hindus and hindus the assamese hindus resented the elite status of silati hindus uh, who had government jobs and who were settled in that region from british times and uh, so uh, in the late 19th century, this uh, rivalry assumed very serious proportion and a new and the new Assamese middle class floated a number of organizations, for example, the Ahom uh, Jatiyo Mahashava, which began work in 1945-46 that expressed alarm at the Bengalization of Assamese society. So Assamese society was seen to be under direct threat by uh, the um, Bengali-speaking Hindus and Muslims uh, uh, who are arriving from Silet. So uh, a major section of the Assamese population was agitated over the outsider issue that, you know, these these terms are very, very loaded terms, particularly in the present day India uh, and in the context of the NRC. But but it, these are these are actually fallouts of the partition. And I see the clear trajectory from the partition. Uh, um, so the uh, ideological ramification of infiltration and the language question in the Barak and the Brahmaputra Valley um, uh, erupted in a Bangal Khada movement where uh, Bengali settlers were targeted. So uh, the Assam movement also uh, criticized, you know, the middle class Assam movement, the Bengal uh, Bangal Khada movement also criticized an Indian law of 1950 that openly encouraged free entry into Assam of Hindus who were victims of disturbances in East Pakistan. Now, in turn, the Bengali settlers' um, uh, consciousness of the language and identity took the uh, shape of an aggressive uh, and defensive linguistic nationalism. This is a very interesting fallout of the partition. Um, you know, where the language question becomes very important. For instance, in 1960, in October 1960, when the um, Assam legislature passed a bill stating that Assamese will be the state language from now on, the Bengali settlers of the Kachar uh, region erupted in uh, uh, opposition. Uh, because they always thought that the Shurma Barak, uh, Barak Valley region was always um, a, a, a center of uh, uh, Bengali literature and Bengali um, language and uh, Bengali culture. And uh, therefore, um, now when the bill was passed, um, you know, there was a lot of agitation. And on 19th of May, 1961, a procession of students um, and writers went on a peaceful march through Shilchot town and the police opened fire on them. And a 15-year-old student, Kamala Bhattacharjo, and 10 others died in the police um, uh, firing and they became what is known as language martyrs. So we know of the language martyrs of Bangladesh, uh, which is Ekushe February, 21st of sec uh, February, which is celebrated as now as International Mother Tongue Day. But we don't know about, very few of us know about this other language movement, which is, which had uh, taken place in the, uh, 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 in the Barak Valley. Uh, Shomali, I have another uh, 15 minutes or so. Shomali, I have another 15 uh, Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you have 20 minutes, ma'am. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay.
So uh, what mm. I'm trying to actually establish is a twofold idea. That is, uh, with the partition, the physical isolation of the Northeast, and I'm now going to talk about another issue which is very interesting, the literary isolation of the Northeast. So um, uh, a Northeast is seen as geographically and physically diff uh, separate from what is mainland India. You know, this is a very interesting term that I often hear, you know, people using mainland uh, India, as well as the literary centers of Calcutta and Dhaka. You know, um, now this sense of isolation has um, a very interesting trajectory um, uh, when we come to the form that the writers in this region are using. What is the form that these writers are using? that uh, makes this uh, isolation a, a, a physical thing in their story, uh, in their writing. Uh, uh, and and uh, I think this is, of course, my idea, and I'm happy to take questions on this. Um, this has resulted, this sense of isolation has resulted in um, uh, an uh, uh, in a search for a form that will encapsulate the region's affected dimension of uh, what 47 has meant to writers of this region. So I find the short story as uh, the chosen form of many writers of this region rather than the novel. If you look at West Bengal's partition literature, you will see the novel is predominantly um, uh, uh, the genre that is being taken up again and again by writers, Atin Bhattopadhyay, Neil Kanto, Bakir Koji, and other other um, uh, writers as well. Of course, there are lots of short stories uh, as well, but but in the in, in Tripura and Assam, the short story becomes extremely important because the form of the short story gives expression to this ambivalence, which I find um, not only to the mainland Bengali literary culture, but also uh, articulates the location of the writers in terms of the Indian nation. So here we also come to this idea of who is in the periphery, how does the periphery talk to the center and vice versa. So, uh, 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 and all these terms are extremely problematic as, as my uh, talk is going to, uh, I think already has established. So uh, these stories exhibit what Amir Mufti calls the problem of minoritization. So that uh, this is, this is, that is the writer turns to a minor form. Um, the short story is not considered, you know, these are Western, of course, uh, ideas that um, the novel is the predominant form of modernity. But here we see the writers are actually choosing a form which is not a major form. They are choosing a minor, minor epic form to explore themes of homelessness, identity, belonging, and that curves out a different aesthetic impulse from that mainstream canonical Bangla fiction. So thus, the specificities of the region and politics have uh, developed a corpus of writing that is quite different and substantially different from West Bengal's Bangla stories about the partition. The short stories that come out of the partition experience in Tripura and Assam have some very distinctive features, both in terms of themes and genres, and I'm going to now go to the stories so that um, you can actually um, uh, see how uh, these stories are um, uh, using certain um, uh, symbols or metaphors um, uh, that are quite common. Um, and of course, um, uh, also their uh, use of time. How does time, how is time delineated in these stories? And many of these stories are travel stories. I'm using the term from uh, Michel de Certeau. Uh, these are travel stories that show us a geography of exile. 
So a small constricted room or uh, the journey which is undertaken by foot um, or, um, you know, the borders, the borders which are very fluid and porous and which the characters are constantly um, crossing. So these stories concentrate on the quotidian movement of the characters through space and place. And the stories, therefore, go beyond the historical accumulation of data. Uh, you know, you when you are reading history, you are confronted by data. So many thousand people entered, so many thousand people left, you know, but they go these these stories actually go beyond data uh, to map an eloquent, effective approach to what we may know. What is it that we may know? So it is, it is uh, in these stories, um, time is both synchronic and diachronic um, because in these stories, the trope of exile uh, makes, uh, 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 is actually uh, figured on a grid. Uh, so there is the clock time and there is the time that the character remembers in memory. So the, the two kinds of time coincide. And it is in this intermingling of the present and the past that we uh, see a kind of how these stories perform an epistemological function of knowing the unknowable. How do we know the life of a refugee? How do we know the tedium vitae the, the, of a refugee's life, of an exile's life? Um, and that is how these stories are absolutely brilliant uh, stories that, uh, uh, you know, uh, map out uh, uh, the lives of these marginal uh, characters. Uh, let me first talk about Jhumur Pandey's Mukhoda Shundori uh, uh, Harano Prapti. Um, it is a memory text with a lyrical quality of language and affect, and ma uh, language is very important in Jhumur's story. Um, it begins with a marriage song, Chalur Talai Jhamur Jhumur Kolar Talai Bia. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, I cannot translate this. This is in Sileti. Uh, maybe Shomali can later translate this uh, if she knows Sileti, um, or if we have some Sileti speakers in the audience. Um, uh, but this is a marriage song uh, that the old woman, Mukhoda Shundari, rem remembers as she is living destitute and alone in the Meherpur relief camp. So the story is set on two planes of time past and the present, which I've already uh, uh, talked about. And Mukhoda remembers a life before the division of the country. That is, this is one time, that is her memory of a life of plenitude uh, and uh, then the subsequent uprooting and uh, the present time that she spends in the refugee camp. Um, so uh, she is during the riot, her, her husband is killed and she is separated from her young son, Kokun. Um, so many years later, as she, uh, in the relief camp, the now very old Mukhoda, and this is something which is marvelous in uh, Jumur's story because the protagonist is not a young person, you know, it is, it is also about the old. How does the old connect to, uh, connect, uh, to the past with the memory, uh, with, uh, connect with the past through their memory? So uh, 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 the story goes like this, I quote, Mukhoda is alive. Yes, she still waits for Kokon. If one day the boy comes wandering here, searching for his mother, how old will he be now? If he had been eight or 10 then, he must be 60 years old now. Will Mukhuda recognize her 60-year-old son? End of quote. Pandey's story employs a slew of narrative strategies uh, to represent this loss. You know, this is just not a physical loss of a mother losing her child. It is also the loss of a life, the life of plenitude that she had before the partition. Uh, and this, uh, um, uh, uh, 
this loss is actually flapped by Pandey uh, through the insertion of folk songs in the Sileti language in the body of the text. So the marriage songs that Mokoda remembers from the past, the images of rituals as she comes into her in-law's house as a young bride, her own life as a wife and a daughter-in-law are interspersed in the narrative. Um, uh, with the present day poverty and loneliness um, that she uh, that she is uh, undergoing in her small cramped room without a window. And her last assertion in the story is Manusher Monre partition dia bandha jaini go. The human heart cannot be confined through a partition. These are the affective resonances of a loss. The word partition is now a new word in her vocabulary, along with the names of trees and flowers and food and people and places. Um, and, and this, uh, uh, you know, coming into this new word that comes into her vocabulary is, of course, um, also uh, shows us her intangible sense of sorrow and nostalgia um, uh, that cannot be captured with words, but words are the only thing that Mokoda has. Borokoshto go, borokoshto, she reiterates how painful it is, what pain. So Pandey's story hints at the inflexibility of history, just as it states the intractability of words to convey uh, a sense of loss and grief. And it is, of course, uh, you know, also by inserting the Sileti language into the Bangla story, uh, you know, the language of the Sileti people now uh, swamped under the hegemonic uh, mainstreams of Bangla and Assamese, um, this insertion of the Sileti language into the story then is an articulation of uh, an act of remembrance. It's an articulation of an act of remembrance of a culture, a homeland, a way of life now gone forever. Now, let me turn to the story uh, by Shunanda Bhattacharya, and I have five, um, two, three minutes. I will finish talking about that story, um, but I'm happy to take questions if there are um, uh, anything that comes to your mind. Now, um, in border stories, Bhattacharya's story, uh, border stories, um, it, these are a collection of vignettes based on characters who inhabit a small space on Tripura's border with Bangladesh. So the narrative space of the story is broken into fragments, like the border is. The border is fragmented and the story is also in fragments, literally and metaphorically mirroring the fragmentation that borders have wrecked in the lives of the inhabitants. The story, however, reveals that the border is a place of relations and relationships in spite of its fragmentations, and is a place where people live and people eke out a living through arbitrary strategies of surveillance and resistance. So rather than contestation and dispute, the caprices of the border are defeated by human will to survive against all odds. So the militarization of the border, because this is an international and it is guarded by the border security force, uh, the militarization of this border imposes certain restrictions and anomalies, but they cannot defeat the ties of economy, labor, and movement that bind the people who live on the two sides of the borders. So the, one of the main character in uh, Shunanda's story is Shubal Bishash, a, a smuggler who was once a cultivator in East Pakistan, but who has now crossed the border to come and live in Tripura, and who has who is landless, who is lower caste landless uh, uh, man who has um, who cannot go back to cultivation. So therefore, he takes up the next best thing, uh, 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 smuggling, and uh, so he he has 
uh, a large stake like his boss, Horipada Goshami, to keep the border porous. Um, so does the BSF man who protects the border, B.D. Singh, who is also a character in the story. And it is a set of intertwining relationships that allow the border to be alive and yet to impinge on people's lives in myriad ways. Now, uh, let me just read a short section from the story and then I will stop. Everyone knew, I'm quoting from the story, everyone knew who went smuggling at the dead of the night across the border. Nobody gave a hoot about it. After all, they never created the border. If there was an epidemic of cholera on one side, uh, people's lives were saved with medicines from this side. The hill, hillish march from one side decorated the dinner plates of people from the other side. Many homes were kept, many homes here kept a pile of stacked goods, a carton of medicines or a few sacks of salt or soap or cosmetics to smuggle out when the coast was clear. The time when onion prices had to hit the roof on this side of the border, sacks of onions from the other side had made the, some people very rich. From the time he understood it, Shubal Bishash had seen the state of affairs. And uh, like Shubal, there is another character, another character who is also a smuggler, who is um, uh, also ruminating on the border. And he looks at the chor, you know, the sandbanks on the rivers, which are regularly disputed between, disputed land between India and Bangladesh. Um, and um, uh, he, he, uh, uh, he talks, he thinks about the chore, and um, this is a quote again. On his left was a fertile chore made by the shifting river, acre and acre of lush land, untilled. Remember, these are um, uh, landless peasants who are talking about this chore, which are the disputed land. Whose fault was that? I'm continuing the quote. On Mohori chore, the sunlight came down with the winter fog. In the moonlit breeze over the chore, Nitai's laments were carried off to the deepest point of the river that was the Indira Mujib Treaty. In border stories, I have the end of the quote ends there. In border stories, the landscape is fertile with tales not only of the past but also of the present. The disputed chore land is a place for, where children from both sides congregate to play football. The factitious border becomes in brief moments a site of play, of relationship, a pause of hostility between two sides. And this excitement is of course benign and harmless. So the chore stretching over a few acres um, is um, also a site of rejuvenation, is also a site of play, is also a site of uh, mm, mm, uh, existence and relationships. Um, and Nitai says, those who quarreled about this side and that side um, have made life difficult. There, if there were no sides, how good it would be. During winter, the char land yielded a bumper crop of potatoes, three crops easily a year. There would be no need to smuggle goods. But what was the use of saying all this? So, uh, 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 Shunanda's story, which is set in the spatio-temporal frame of Tripura, is actually talking of the borders of the state, you know, the link that connects Tripura to the post-colonial Indian state through its borders. But uh, it is also the borders, which is unable to keep out people. It becomes a site of the forms and practices of marginality and reciprocity through which the state is experienced and undone. So the semantic meaning of migrations and settlements borders and borderlands are reconstituted in these stories and refashioned through the uh, ideas of marginalization and the idea that political violence lives at the heart of the modern post-colonial state. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.
yes madam thank you so much madam for such a brilliant and vibrant presentation uh, you have taken uh, the writings of assam and tripura and for that one uh, thank you so much madam for highlighting the northeast and there are so many questions uh, which are here for you uh, the questions will be displayed on the screen ma'am uh, yes thank you yeah. yes i'm going through one by one uh, give me a second yes please take your time since i'm the last speaker of the day yes. you know we can take 5 minutes extra yeah yeah man of course why not can you see ma'am uh, the question yes. on your screen yes uh, there is a story from lala saheb patil is this uh, refute uh, to uh, the short story writing unintentional or is it the inability of the writers from the northeast to exercise a major genres of fiction and drama uh, i do not think it is um, uh, an inability they choose to uh, uh, write uh, they choose to foreground the short story because of a certain um, uh, uh, issues of location and language i think i talked about it in some detail in the beginning of my uh, presentation but um, uh, but uh, you know this whole uh, uh, hierarchy that uh, 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 some genres are major and some genres are minor are it is itself a problematic hierarchy um, uh, you know uh, it is it is a very colonial uh, uh, hierarchy that has been created through 19th century english studies that fiction and drama are better than the short story uh, you know that these are epic forms um, so i think i am also trying to actually nudge my audience into thinking about uh, the hierarchy of forms which are also uh, sometimes present in the way we think about literature uh and i don't see this as a shortcoming on the on the on the part of the writers from assam and tripura because they choose to write uh, a short story instead of a novel jumur pande actually has number of novels um it's not that and so does shunanda patichari uh, but uh, uh, the stories i'm i'm mainly concerned about the stories of 1947 that talk of 1947 and the fallout in that i find the short story to be the chosen Uh, form. Yes, and I yes, think yes. that form is uh, deliberately chosen because it it shows uh, the ambiguity of location, uh, the location of what we think as these writers as marginal writers because they are in the northeast. Yes, yes. And that ambiguity, I think, is very interesting. We need to think about it. Another question, ma'am. Uh... Shukana Das's question: How a partition affected the livelihood and identity of the women in Tripura and Assam? Um, uh, I have already um, talked in um, Jumul Pandey's story um, uh, about a woman uh, who is uh, the protagonist of a story, but um, uh, uh, the effect, the effective, uh, the effective way in which. women were uh, uh, in uh, uh, were uh, uh, you know really really they came under partition's shadow was in terms of labor and i think it's very important for us to remember that you know because um, in in the borak valley as well as in uh, tripura a large number of uh, migrations happened over um, uh, after 247 that is a large number of uh, migrations took place amongst agriculturalist families families who were at one time uh, agriculturalists in east pakistan but who were now landless so uh, uh, how you know in many ways the labor of women whose whose labor we could not actually see uh, you know in terms of uh, figures or data were largely affected because their labor which was inside the house now has to 
come out in the open because of sustenance. Um, yes. Uh, and and, and uh, I would refer you to a wonderful story by Shunanda Bhattacharji called um, Kerech Buri Brittanto about this Brahmin widow who, after the partition, sells kerosene to make a livelihood. And it's a, absolutely a brilliant story. I have translated it. Uh, so it's available in English um, uh, uh, in my uh, collection, Map Making, Partition Stories from Two Bengals. And um, uh, in this story, you actually see the transformation of labor. You know how a Brahmin widow who was upper caste but, uh, and well off and with landed property after the partition becomes absolutely poverty stricken and how she then has to, um, you know, uh, contend with a, a kind of livelihood. Um, how does she, um, uh, she loses her family, she's alone in the world and therefore she takes recourse to a very menial uh, undertaking selling kerosene in the village yes. to uh, to uh, you know to make a livelihood and it's a, it's an absolutely brilliant story in which uh, uh, shunanda talks about uh, the uh, gendered aspect of partitions violence yes yes uh, another relevant question madam Oh, oh, Tri Mojundar is a wonderful question. Do you think that the partition archive suffers from a selective amnesia when it comes to the Northeast? Is this exclusion deliberate, symptomatic of a discriminatory politics of memory? Wonderful question, Mr. Mojundar. And I think you are absolutely spot on. I think <laughs> there is a very interesting selective amnesia when it comes to the Northeast because, you know, um, uh, as I said, uh, you know, I live in uh, the heart of uh, North India and in, in, in many in, in may, many people here in North India don't even know that Assam was bifurcated. Yes. That there was a there was a referendum, the only referendum in the East uh, where we, when we talk of the Silet referendum. So, you know, there is, of course, a politics behind, a politics of um, exclusion. Um, but um, uh, I would actually like to go beyond this. I would like to see this as not just exclusion, but is, I would like to see this also as a way in which the archive has refused to hear what the margins are saying. And I'm not using the word margin as I am saying, I'm using it in quotes. So I think the archive really needs to listen. There has to be a dialogue between the center and the margin. You know, it is, it is and you know, my work is very small, uh, you know, but I hope that people like you, young scholars, young researchers will take up uh, uh, you know this question in a very big way. I started um, in a very small way. Um, and as I said in the beginning, you know, I'm hampered by the lack of language. Um, there are so many languages um, uh, in the Northeast. For instance, I would, you know, I would refer you to this wonderful essay by Akhtaru Jumanilias from Bangladesh, Chakma uh, Upanash um, Chai. Uh, Where is the Chakma? storytellers who have taught told us about 47 because the chakmas were um, um, directly affected by 47 yes you yes 40000 yes. people 40000 families chakma families had to leave Maimonshing and rampur and the chittagong hill trucks to come into india um, after 47 where is their story uh, so it is also a question of language you see so the archive is not just something that is exclusionary because it chooses to be exclusionary. There's also the problem of language. And I think here, people like us, you know, people who have a connection to the East, people who know the languages of the Eastern regions have a very big role to play. We must talk about this region. We must talk about the languages and the literatures of this region. I would love to see a Chakma writer talking about 47 and then that being translated into English because I don't read uh, the Chakma language. But I, uh, so 
uh, the archive is not just exclusion exclusion the archive also uh, uh, performs with a certain shortcoming Thank you so much, Madam. Of course, uh, in the near future, we will get some texts uh, the Chakma people, and they will write, of course. And uh, of course, we are getting to get the translated versions. Uh, another question, Madam, uh, it's quite interesting. People both the subalterns and the middle class enjoy the smuggled goods very much until recently in this region. Do you feel that uh, the loved memory of home lost worked among them? Um, uh, Mr. Chakraborty, um, uh, are you talking about lost home? Um, if it is about lost home, then yes. Uh, for instance, in Bhattacharjee's story, uh, Border Stories, uh, Nitai, one of the smugglers, is constantly remembering, uh, as well as, uh, sorry, Shubal Vishash, one of the smugglers who I began uh, quoting, um, Shubal Vishash constantly remembers his uh, lost home in Bangladesh. Um, the 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 uh, the plenitude, for instance, the R and the Sholmach that he ate, um, and the um, uh, and the huge uh, lunch of rice and uh, uh, fish um, that he remembered. The uh, the you know so uh, the uh, the whole idea of the lost home is very much present in the uh, in the ruminations of uh, the people. Uh, who have, because of the partition, have uh, become smugglers. Not because they wanted to become smugglers, but because they lost their lands and um, chose to um, cross the border uh, into a space where very few uh, life, uh, options of livelihood are open to them. Uh, madam, there is another participant. Uh, let's see. Uh, the names of the Beng uh, novels on Bengali partition. Um, uh, Mr. Lal, I don't know whether you read uh, Bangla or not, uh, but um, uh, if you read Bangla, um, I can give you the names of a couple of very interesting uh, partition novels. Um, uh, for instance, uh, one of my favorite is, uh, sorry about it, but this is a novel which I particularly like, is Manik Bondapadhyay's Shadinatar Shad, The Taste of Freedom. Uh, this was uh, published in 1950 or 51. Uh, sorry, I can't recollect the exact date. It is called Shadinatar Shad. The Taste of Freedom, and it talks about um, 46, uh, just uh, the just before uh, the actual division of the country. But it is very interesting because it is a kind of rumination on what the Calcutta riots have meant um, and how it sort of paves the way for the division of the country. Um, and that is number one. Uh, the other novel which I mentioned is, of course, very popular and very famous in uh, Bangla called Atin Baddhapadhyay's Nilkantho Pakhir Khoje. It's a very famous novel and I'm not very sure. I don't think it has been uh, uh, translated into English. Um, and another personal favorite is uh, Shokti Padu Rajguru's Megheda Patara, which is, of course, been made into a brilliant film uh, by Riti Ghatuk. Um, uh, the cloud capped star. If you cannot access the novel in Bangla, then you can certainly see the film. Um, it is, I think, one of the greatest films that this country has produced. Um, and uh, uh, the novel uh, is, of course, uh, available. Uh, its earlier name was Chena Muk, but later on uh, it was republished as Megheda by Shokti Padu Rajguru. Uh, Ma'am, the last question. Uh, Mr. Wayne, uh, you have asked, would you speak a few lines on the literary isolation which impacted life during that period? Um, I am talking about uh, a, a kind of isolation which has impacted the region after 47 because um, 
uh, you see, uh, if you, if you, I, I'm sorry, I should have shown a few maps, but if you see the present day uh, map of India, you will see that the northeastern region is connected to the rest of India by this narrow, what we call the chicken neck. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very narrow strip of land, which is cutting across Assam and West Bengal. Uh, and, uh, and, and a large part of the Northeast is actually in that sense, uh, not accessible to the rest of the Indian uh, uh, main, mainland. Um, so it is not just an isolation, which is just physical, but it is also a kind of, it has also bred a kind of, and a, uh, a kind of sense of detachment from the literary, um, uh, canonical literary mainstream publishing industry of Kolkata and Dhaka. You see, because the publishing industry is very, uh, I know it is in Hailakandi and in Shilchar and in Tripura, in Agartala, the publishing industry is quite vibrant. But books from these regions cannot, um, do not come into Kolkata uh, very easily. So there is a very interesting, uh, books from West Bengal go there, but books from there do not come. So, uh, the literary isolation is also an isolation which is also because physically these writers and authors and publishers are physically removed from the publishing uh, centers of Kolkata and Dhaka. And uh, this literary isolation, therefore, uh, um, I'm not commenting whether it is good or bad. I'm not saying whether it is good or bad. It's a fact of history that because of the geographical uh, positioning of the region, um, the writers have um, uh, seen themselves as belonging to what they call the third world of Bangla literature. So the first world is the publishing industry of West Bengal. The second world is the publishing industry in Dhaka. And the third world is the publishing industry of Bangla fiction in Assam and Tripura. So they call, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm just quoting a very uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, literary critic from the region who says that there is, there exists a third world uh, in Bangla fiction writing in the Northeast. Uh, uh, but uh, that is a contentious issue. I think Bangla as a language has um, uh, uh, has uh, is not a homogeneous term. It has different ramifications. It is Bangla has a lot of dialects. I talked about the Sileti dialect, for instance, which is very different from Siletis have a uh, Sileti Nagori script, which is very different from the Bangla script. Um, uh, so, uh, but Bangla has many may, uh, many streams that go from. Uh, it's uh, literary. Uh, it has many cross currents. Um, so uh, I hope I have been able to answer your question, but it's a very large question. Uh, uh, and it's not possible to just answer it very briefly. Uh, but thank you so much, Madam, uh, for such a scintillating and effective presentation. It was a great one, great interactive session. And uh, Madam, actually, we, the people of Northeast, we are directly or indirectly inflicted by the memories of partition. And it, yes. it just gives us a kind of heartache no? when we uh, listen to the stories from our ancestors who were the direct sufferers because of partition. Yes. Uh, yes. Did, yes, you, did madam. you have people in your own family who crossed, uh, who came? Yes, why not, to? madam? Yes, uh, actually, yes. uh, my grandfather, no, maternal grandfather, a maternal he grandmother, Tripura, they were, yeah, yeah, but they were greatly uh, tortured because of that partition issues uh, in, during the 1971. And my maternal um, grandfather, he was, he was shot dead. And, uh, oh, I'm so sorry uh, to hear that. yes. And our whole family, a family of my, uh, that is maternal side, they got suffered 
very much due to that partition. And when I listen to my, the stories from my mother, it, it, it just really gives a heartache to me. And of course, uh, in everybody's side, huh, uh, my colleagues, my friends, they used to say that their ancestors, their uh, fathers, mothers, they used to suffer a lot. And thank you so much, madam, that you have uh, highlighted this particular issue in your lecture. Thank you. And it was, you it was a splendid for, one. Uh, thank you very much, Shamali, for inviting me. I hope. Yeah, um, madam. Uh, I, can, I can see lots of other questions, but uh, yeah. if people really want to get in touch with me, they can email me and I'm very happy to help with whatever little way I can. I will share your email address, madam, to the participants yes, later sir. on. Yes. Uh, now, yes. our HOD, madam, uh, will share some words. She wanted to give you uh, the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Devjani, madam. Uh, the thing is that uh, your uh, speech today, your lecture was really touching. As you, as Somali has said, the people living in Tripura, 99.9% uh, .9 of them are really from East Pakistan. Okay, except if you if you don't take the indigenous people, almost all the Bengalis are from East Pakistan, except a few families whom the king had invited due to different reasons, like my grandfather he was a doctor and uh, last king had invited and we came in the 1941 i mean my mm -hmm. father and my grandfather and all mm -hmm. but still then each and every family like my mother's family they had suffered my uh, grandfather was a conservator of uh, forest and he was killed uh, i mean by the people he, um, the family came back but he could not come back he was killed so all of us have suffered and it was so touching today really when you spoke being a citizen of Tripura, we can easily relate ourselves. That's why really I wanted to talk to you. Because I think there will be no family where with whom you talk who hasn't an incident. Because most of them were well off in East Pakistan. They have to just run away, leaving everything behind in the dark. Leaving their land and money and everything and come here and settle as refugees. And that way you can say we are the first generation, we are those who are well off. They had to come and struggle, ma'am, ma obviously, yes. because they did not have money. They had to do some uh, small kind of job and then raise their children. So my grandfather came, then my father, and now myself. I can call myself as a very, you know, rich lady, I can say that way. But compare if you compare with Punjabis or the other people, those who left their land, you know, they got something in return. But with yeah. Bengalis, we didn't get anything, ma'am. Like yeah. if you think of Sabdardan enclave. I have been to Delhi, my sister was there. You look at the place and you look at the Bengalis staying in India. We didn't get anything from the partition, but that is 47 or 71. We were just treated as refugees only. And madam, I just wanted to clear to the other audiences as you spoke about shifting cultivation. Shifting cultivation is generally called Zoom cultivation in our place here. The indigenous tribe, they call it Zoom where they shift, go on shifting their vegetables. I mean, their pace also shifted in the hills. They cut in the hills and they, and they grow the crops and the next time they'll cut another place and then they grow. That is really the Zoom cultivation, the indigenous people they do here. And as you spoke about the chores also, madam, as you know, all of them have lost their, uh, I mean, economically they became very poor. So automatically the chores were really important for the people living in border because once but one time if they could grow, cultivate, the money they would earn could really at least keep their needs for some months, they could survive. So everybody wanted to get hold of those charts. And you know, Agartala, the capital of Tripura is very near to the border. The border yes. is just one and a half kilometer from uh, yeah. this college itself where we are sitting. So we are very well aware of all the things that are going on because uh, uh, we see and uh, I don't know, the government has to also keep quiet because I think first on humanitarian ground, sometimes we have to shut our mouth even if we stay near the uh, borders because people have to leave first. After that, everything comes. If one is dead, then there, if without yeah. people, uh, nation cannot run. So I think that is also another reason uh, reason why many things are overlooked, though the government always tries the BSM and everything is there. But still then something creeps up between maybe livelihood is the first option. Another thing, ma'am, I just wanted to say, all the uh, Bengalis from East Pakistan, Silettis are also 
one of them uh, kumilla maimon singh dhaka we are ourselves are from dhaka so all those people still we don't uh, we are not carrying on our, all the rituals or we don't carry it forward we have now a mixed culture staying here with people from kumilla noakhali maimon singh silet and all but the silet is the still they are very you know they follow and they very meticulously they follow all their uh, what uh, what should i say all the uh, rituals and everything the songs that they have to sing for the um, marriage or the song that is sung on the last day of posh march you know the posh sangranti days they still carry on that but we have now a mixed culture and the but the cities are still they haven't forgotten their culture as the other bengalis of east pakistan has done this is what ma'am i just wanted to convey to the people those who are not bengalis and don't understand the feeling of feelings of the bengali from east pakistan i should rather say so thank you ma'am for enlightening us and you have really done a great job staying in delhi another thing yes ma'am we really feel isolated those who are staying here physically as well as mentally every for everything because if we just have to kolkata we can't catch a train we have to take a flight yeah. so the, the closest place from here is calcutta if we want to go to the mainland and for that we for that we need a flight we don't have good roads or uh, railways now recently it is coming up last 2 3 year, years but still it takes us 3 and a half days we prefer a 45 minutes flight than uh, than a train because we cannot carry the person those who are sick and ill in train they have to be transported to calcutta for better treatment so we really feel isolated i don't know when everything will be okay i think our children will get it ma'am we are very grateful to you for uh, at least presenting tripura to the whole world assam and tripura thank you very much ma'am uh, dr nath thank you very much i if, if if it were not for covid i would have been physically in agartala and yeah would, we welcome uh, you ma'am any time you get here you are most welcome to agartala we would, you would really love, love the place to, love to come to agartala but uh, you know um, but my because i have always sort of researched this area for so long now um and um, i am hoping that inshallah maybe one day we will be able to meet face to face instead of yes, on yes. stream yard yeah of course madam of course it's a small place but you'll really love it thank you ma'am yeah we are waiting for you madam till the corona thank days are so over much. then we will be back yeah. ma'am we invite you to come to agartala with your family thank madam you. yes thank you Thank you, madam. Good noon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. So much. Goodbye, ma'am. Namaskar. Goodbye. Namaskar. Uh, so, my dear participants, the lecture session is over. now it is the time for the valedictory session and in the valedictory session we have with us uh, shrimati kv geeta uh, secretary of teachers council women's college uh, so before the valedictory session i want to summarize the events of the three days international webinar uh, i will take only one to two minute to summarize it it's my duty to give the gist to all the participants uh the inaugural session of the webinar started at 12 noon of 7th august which was virtually graced by the honorable minister of higher education and the director of higher education government of tripura as well as by the principal of women's college agartala tripura india in the first technical session we got the chance of enjoying the lectures of professor rajkumar who is the professor and head of the department of english university of delhi and dr ethian rasindran associate professor of english from st joseph's college bangalore in the second technical session of day 2 we were enlightened by the lectures of two great scholars like professor mashur shahid hussain from jahangirnagar university dhaka bangladesh and dr rita banerji who is a retired associate professor from jawaharlal nehru university new delhi 
And in the third technical session of day two, we had the chance to enjoy the great company of uh, Professor Francis Xavier Clooney, who was a Parkman Professor of Divinity and a Professor of Comparative Theology from Harvard University, USA. And today in the fourth technical session of day three, as well as the final day, we had with us three very energetic and dynamic speakers, such as Dr. Pallavi Gupta, lecturer in English from the University of Illinois, USA, Dr. Sujata Menon, language teacher and trainer from Zazan University, Saudi Arabia, and Dr. Devjani Shengupta from Indraprastha College for Women, University of Delhi. So that is the summary of the uh, three days international webinar on neither East nor West vistas of post-colonial discourses. Now, I want to request uh, KB Gita, madam, uh, to please. Madam, please continue. Am I, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Good evening. It's my proud privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of the Teachers' Council, Women's College, Agartala, Tripura, and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all who are a part of this virtual platform. On the occasion of the three-day international webinar on neither East nor West, Vistas of Post-Colonial Discourses, organized by Department of English, Women's College, Agartala, Tripura, India. These three days were a great literary feast for the people who love literature. It's a webinar which is international in true sense as men of letters from Harvard University, University of Illinois, USA, Jazan University, Saudi Arabia, Jahangirnagar University, Bangladesh, and from other eminent universities of India, such as Jawaharlal Nehru University, University of Delhi, Indraprastha College for Women, New Delhi, and St. Joseph's College, Bangalore, participated and enlightened us with their great knowledge and expertise on their very topics. We all are awed and feel enriched by the thought-provoking and rich discussion of literature from speakers world over, which may not have been possible without a virtual platform. Well, ladies and gentlemen, an event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling weeks ago. It requires meticulous planning and a bird's eye for details. I thank the Department of English for having conceived the idea of this webinar and for successfully organizing the event to its perfection. My special thanks goes to the HOD, Department of English, Srimati Sharvari Nath, and of course, the organizing secretary, Dr. Shomali Shaha, who was instrumental in making the event a reality. We have been fortunate enough to get the support of our ever inspiring principal, Srimati Manidipa Dev Barma, who is a constant encouragement to all of us. From the beginning of the conception of this webinar, we were fortunate enough to be supported by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues, Dr. Rahul Bhattacharji, Srimati Seema Dutta, Srimati Pushparang Rangkhal. The technical support given by the team helped in the smooth conduct and perfect culmination of this webinar. I cannot thank everyone enough, including the members of advisory committee, Dr. Shoma Bani and Dr. Jayanti Bhattacharji for their involvement and willingness to take on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zones. I must not forget to thank near about 2,000 participants who showed overwhelming response by re registering with us and supported us by keeping themselves continuously connected through this virtual platform on all these three days. We are really encouraged and got boosted up for future endeavors. It has been a great pleasure connecting with you all. I would like to conclude with the famous quote of John Ruskin, quality is never an accident. It is always the result of intelligent effort. Thank you one and all. Stay safe, stay connected. Shomali. Yes, madam. Thank you so much for your 
vote of thanks it was a very pleasing experience to hear from you and being the secretary of teachers council you already just showered your all kind of help to us and i want to share here that whatever we are doing in the background there are so many people who are tirelessly working behind the screen uh, to make our webinar a successful one of course i want to pay my thanks to our principal madam uh, she is not able to come here virtually today because i want to uh, just inform the participants that yesterday she just lost her mother in law uh, for that reason she is not able to come uh, in this political session and uh, we have uh, with us our hod madam uh, for, and i am thankful to her for her constant support and guidance and thanks to the advisory committee whatever kv gita madam already uh, just told dr jayanti bhattacharya uh, dr shoma banik and you madam ms kv gita uh, you have uh, just tirelessly work uh, in these days for making the registration links feedback links certificate links so thank you so much for that effort and uh, we have a very energetic and young technical committee and i want to introduce our technical committee uh, to the audience because they are behind the screen and we are indebted to them that they have sacrificed a vast amount of time for the successful completion of this webinar so i am just uh, introducing you to uh, the very energetic lady uh, shrimati pushpa rangkhol she is uh, shrimati pushpa rangkhol who is always beside us and another very dynamic personality dr Hi. rahul bhattacharya department bolle na department bolo dr rahul bhattacharya is an associate professor for department of physics and shrimati pushpa rangkhol she is an assistant professor from department of it and another colleague Shrimati Shima Datta, who is also an assistant professor of Department of IT. She is not able to join us because of some personal problems. But yeah, I, we can't uh, deny her help also. She was uh, always with us behind the screen. And of course, I want to uh, just um, be grateful to, the, to our friends, to our colleagues, to our well-wishers, to our teachers, to our family members, everybody they were working behind the screen and i can feel their virtual presence with us because without their wishes without their blessings it will not be possible for us to continue this particular effort uh, without any uh, so much we didn't feel actually we didn't face so much so many technical glitches uh, we were very much afraid of that in one or two sessions uh, there was some problem and we regret for that inconvenience from our part we tried to give our best and it is of course your support which was there behind the screen and uh, of course sharbari madam will also uh, say uh, her feelings and madam uh, what do you want to say please share yeah thank you thank you somali it's really true all our colleagues really worked hard i mean uh, only you have seen both of us uh, in front of the camera but all the names that she has mentioned they have really worked hard and uh, for us it was a very smooth sailing you can say because our technical experts from the department of it and physics they were really excellent and they helped us and we are we are really feeling very proud today after the end of the webinar that we could do it uh, in, in such a smooth manner because you know this is the first time we are trying uh, we tried with so many participants from different parts of the world and, uh, and almost 1800 members those who have joined us also from different uh, parts of the world and it ran so smoothly that we are really indebted to our technical people our uh, IT department and physics department for uh, for uh, helping us to run this program so smoothly so uh, at the end of the day as HO of English, I am really feeling very proud for uh, hosting such a nice and 
you can say uh, almost uh, technically we didn't have any fault those small ones one or two we can just ignore them because this is the first time we are availing such a platform and we are not experts also in this everybody is trying in, uh, a trial and error method so uh, thank you all viewers and we today after the uh, completion of this we i'm really proud and i'm really thankful to all my colleagues to the minister of higher education to the director of uh, uh, higher education who really encourages encouraged us and he is always very encouraging our director he's a dynamic person and he likes all this kinds of webinars and he constantly keeps on telling us and he's happy that we could gather so many people from throughout the world and host such a nice um, uh, session and i am also thankful to our secretary teachers council secretary srimati geeta kevi geeta who has tried her lot she was she's very quiet person you know and from back she has helped us with all making all the uh, this one certificates and all those uh, things that we needed our feedback forms along with uh, soma bonik so thank you all and i think we can end our session here i think can we yes sir yes sir when one more concluding comment i will oh, end the session yeah okay so uh, I, from my side i am really thankful to all and i think it's all your blessings and the blessing of our, our elders those who have helped us and our principal as uh, as uh, somalia said today we are feeling very bad because we couldn't make our principal sit by our side who is always very enthusiastic about any good things that we do for the college and she always encourages us and tells us so that we keep on trying all these things new things but we are very sad that should today she couldn't come due to some personal problem as uh, somali has told you all so over to somali yes thank you sharbani madam so uh, i want to end this session with uh, my concluding remarks uh, the thing is that women's college always work together like a team and it is the team spirit that is working behind the screen for the successful uh, completion of this webinar and we are extremely grateful to all the participants who are listening to the videos listening to the recorded lectures and we can see the increased number of uh, feedbacks the uh, sharing which is coming to us and of course uh, the chat box the telegram chat box will be open for you for today so that we can uh, see whatever suggestion queries and comments you are uh, giving us and of course in the future days we will come with such endeavors and just we need your blessings and good wishes and i from my core of heart being the organizing secretary of this webinar i just put my thank you to all of you you just stay blessed stay virtually connected and learn till then goodbye stay safe stay safe stay healthy all of you thank you namaskar thank you so much namaskar